Hello everyone. If you're a fan of SCP Explained, you'll know that we regularly post interesting questions in our community tab, asking for responses from you, our dear fans. These have ranged from questions about specific anomalies like SCP-096, or your suggestions on how we should actually kill SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile. We've even asked you which anomalous powers you'd want to have and posed your questions directly to SCP-343, also known as God, and of course, the terrifying and infamous Scarlet King. But in our latest community question, asking you about hypothetical crossovers between the SCP Foundation and the weird wild multiverse of all fiction, you truly outdid yourself with thousands upon thousands of responses. And we thought rather than just making one video selecting our favorites, we'd turn each of our favorites into whole videos. And how are we going to do that? That's where this wonderful state-of-the-art gizmo comes into play. You may remember the Anomatron 6000, our incredibly advanced artificial intelligence-driven supercomputer designed specifically to run simulations for the SCP Foundation. We fed this computer data from countless SCP Foundation experiments and cross-tests, and all the data from your suggestions. This will allow the fine folks at the SCP Foundation to explore any anomalous hypothetical without risking the lives of staff members or civilians. This brings us to our first simulation, suggested in a huge number of comments. Could SCP-682 be contained within the backrooms? For those not in the know, the Backrooms is an internet urban legend that spiraled into a full-blown phenomenon. It's built on the premise that if you're not careful and enter certain specific circumstances, you can no-clip out of our reality and enter a terrifying multi-level alternate reality, where you're stalked by a variety of bizarre and frightening creatures. This could be a complete nightmare for your average person, but how would it play out if SCP-682 the endlessly angry, hard-to-destroy reptile found its way inside. Also, for another Backrooms-related surprise, stick around until the end of the video. In the meantime, though, let's boot up the Anomatron and test this new scenario. The worst had happened again. SCP-682 had busted out of containment during a cross-test and started making a beeline for the nearest populated area. Several helicopters containing heavily armed MTF New 7 Hammerdown members were in hot pursuit, attempting to slow the vicious reptile down with targeted sniper fire at its legs. But it seems that these efforts were all for naught. SCP-682 had already reached the defunct industrial district on the edge of a nearby city, and if the beast managed to actually reach a populated area, all hell would break loose. That's when they pulled out the heavy weaponry. Miniguns mounted to the helicopters unleashed a rain of hellfire down onto SCP-682. However, 682 managed to dodge most of the bullets and simply tank the rest. Command authorized the use of heavy ordnance, the helicopter's missile launchers. They'd pick up the pieces afterwards, once SCP-682 was back in containment. However, the reptile had plans of its own. It charged into a nearby abandoned chemical plant to avoid the gunfire from above. This was exactly what Hammerdown wanted. The helicopters circled around the chemical plant and unleashed a barrage of powerful incendiary missiles, blowing the plant to kingdom come, in hopes of dragging an incapacitated 682 out of the rubble afterwards. But when the smoke had cleared and only the rubble was left, 682 was nowhere to be seen. Even for the hardcore operatives of Hammerdown, this caused an anxiety spike. Had it tunneled into the ground, had it adapted to the attack by turning invisible or getting tiny to escape, it'd done all these things before, or after all the deranged attempts at putting SCP-682 in the ground, had some light firebombing killed the monster? Whatever the case, they need to search. In case SCP-682 popped up somewhere else and started causing havoc, if it was still alive, which it probably was, they couldn't rest on their laurels until they'd found it again. Meanwhile, SCP-682 woke up. It felt groggy and irritated, its body resting against an unpleasant, soggy carpet. It licked the carpet. The moisture had the distinct flavor of human spinal fluid, which 682 had tasted many times before. The sickly yellow walls and incessant buzzing from the fluorescent lights up above were nauseating, and it gave 682 a nagging headache. This only made 682's default emotion, blistering rage and hatred, even worse. It began walking around exploring this strange, spatial, anomalous environment. Was this more of that frustrating Foundation trickery? 
Another one of those puerile cross-tests? The last thing 682 remembered was running at one of the walls in the chemical plant, a wall that, in hindsight, seemed darker than all the others. But rather than shattering through the brickwork, it was here now, in this strange, tacky lobby that never seemed to end. It was like a kaleidoscope of empty 1990s office kitsch. Endless, worthless yellow walls arranged like some labyrinthian, nonsensical maze, leading nowhere and devoid of all life as SCP-682 wandered through it. And of course, SCP-682 found it disgusting. It was only on level zero, and already 682 hated the backrooms just as much as it hated our dimension. Someone, or something, had to pay for the crime of inconveniencing it this way, and it would happily turn this whole dimension inside out just to find some beings to kill inside it. Yes, that would be great fun. SCP-682 began its frantic search for an exit, evolving an innate sonar ability and picking up speeds that would be impossible for human beings. This is the part where most people would go mad or die from hunger or thirst. SCP-682? Not so much. It could keep searching and searching and searching until the stars burned out in the sky. It would find its prey, somehow. And when it did, it would put them through hell. And as it turned out, this new universe rewarded 682's dog's stubbornness because when it passed through a seemingly random hallway after hours of searching, it was in a different place entirely. This place looked like some huge abandoned warehouse complex with water shining off the ground. If 682 had more advanced knowledge of the back rooms, it would have known this was level 1. But the only number SCP-682 cared about was body count, and in that regard it would find level 1 to be a vast improvement. Two groups of humans had established bases in this level of the backrooms. The Major Explorer Group, a faction of professional backrooms travelers who maintained their base alpha on this level, and the Backrooms Non-Aligned Trade Group, a commercial group whose primary base is an economic hub on this very level, a fortified city-like area with a population of 412, which would, a few hours after 682's appearance, be a population of zero. But before all of that, it felt like grabbing a bite at the diner. Tom's Diner is a refuge for many people trapped in the back rooms, a casual eatery nestled into the cold warehouse environment of Level 1, where people could get a warm meal from Tom, a former cook who's been trapped in the back room for years. SCP-682 was eager to be part of this grand tradition, but the hard-to-destroy reptile decided to buck the trend a little by just devouring Tom himself. From there, it decided to launch its rage-fueled offensive against the various humanoid inhabitants of the level. Both the Major Explorer Group Base Alpha and the Backroom's Non-Aligned Trade Group Trade Keep were heavily fortified against the kind of entities these folks had gotten used to facing in the Backrooms, but they were completely unprepared for a creature of SCP-682's sheer power, intelligence, endurance, and ferocity. The SCP Foundation had been studying the creature for decades, with far more resources than either of these two backrooms-bound groups, and they still had a hard time keeping the beast consistently contained. Sadly for the great bastion of human hope in the backrooms, SCP-682 swept through both outposts in a matter of hours, killing everyone there without an ounce of remorse. The only person there it took its time with was the final human being left in the decimated remains of the Major Explorer's Group Base Alpha. It grabbed the man by the throat and squeezed, asking with its guttural, growling voice, You! Were you and your dead brethren allied with the SCP Foundation? Despite his fear, the explorer told 682 that he had never heard of the SCP Foundation, nor did he know what kind of entity 682 was. Hmm, then what is this place? Tell me, and I might give you a quick death. The explorer gave as good a response as he could. 682 was trapped in the back rooms, a multi-leveled interdimensional nightmare filled with dangerous creatures. That made 682 curious. Dangerous creatures? That could make an interesting challenge. 682 asked the explorer how it could access these other levels and find these creatures, and the explorer explained that through exploring these levels enough, anyone could no-clip into the next one. It really was that simple. With that, 682 knew all it needed to know and carelessly murdered the final human being of Level 1. It had killed so many humans over its long and twisted life, it was no different from breathing air now. An utterly perfunctory action. It was eager to discover these other creatures on the lower levels, 
and teach them a new level of fear they'd never experienced. 682 stormed the halls until it achieved the next successful noclip into level 2, which manifested as a series of old dilapidated maintenance tunnels that seemed to stretch on for millions of miles. Wonderful. There were humans here too, apparently. But who cared about them? This was the first level to feature a smorgasbord of entities ripe for the killing. It sped through the tunnels, teeth and fangs born, eager to deal death with gleeful abandon. The first entities it encountered in the expansive tunnels of Level 2 were a collection of beings known as crawlers, insect-like creatures infected with an extremely aggressive fungal growth. Just getting close to them could present an active risk to humans, not so much for a creature that could easily regenerate after being tossed into the sun. As the creatures tried to lunge, SCP-682 simply crushed and devoured them with little effort. They tasted a little stale, on account of the fungus, but the chewiness was pleasing. Hopefully there would be more challenging foes down in the tunnel than these mere insects, SCP-682 thought to itself, while journeying deeper into the endless network of tunnels. Soon enough, SCP-682 ventured into a section of the tunnel engulfed in total darkness. Its eyes quickly adjusted, developing immaculate night vision. That's when it spotted another creature sharing this little slice of darkness with it. A pair of floating, glowing eyes and almost cartoonish teeth, grinning like some maniacal looney tune. This is an entity known as a Smiler, and they're a terrifying threat to any humans venturing through the backrooms. SCP-682 wasn't impressed. It began a perfect adaptation for the situation. Its body began to glow, emitting incredible levels of both heat and light, carving through the darkness of the tunnel and causing the Smiler to emit a terrible, piercing shriek. The sheer heat of this new ability melted sections of the Level 2 tunnels around SCP-682. When the light finally dimmed down to slightly more reasonable levels, where the Smiler once stood was instead a fizzling black scorch mark. Another creature had painfully bitten the dust, and SCP-682 was starting to have some fun. It took off further down into the tunnels, looking forward to finding its next victim. Sadly for SCP-682, it wouldn't get to kill the next set of victims. A group of four child facelings, spooky, faceless little girls who like to cut apart their typical human victims with small objects, were waiting a little further down the pipe. However, when they felt SCP-682 approaching, they almost sensed the power and cruelty of the beast coming towards them. Even being little monsters themselves, Game recognized Game, and they knew that they needed to get the hell out of there before the monster arrived. They climbed between the pipes on the tunnel walls and skittered off into hiding places deep in the dark. Lucky for them, SCP-682 passed them and just kept going. What would be the point in wasting time on these little morsels when there were apparently so many other creatures to massacre down here? Next, SCP-682 came across a truly pathetic creature, something that the mighty reptile honestly felt a little embarrassed even interacting with. It was a creature known as a clump, a strange bundle of living limbs that will move at great speeds and attack its usually human targets. It tried to do the same to SCP-682, maniacally flailing its many twisted limbs. 682 killed it in a single stomp and moved on, feeling its own psychological equivalent of pity, but not that much of it. Not long after Mercy killing the clump, SCP-682 came face to face with a series of hounds, mutant humanoids who travel on all fours, behaving in a wolf-like fashion. This would, of course, be the stuff of nightmares for your average human being, but would far more likely put a being like the hard-to-destroy reptile to sleep with sheer boredom. Humans acting like dogs, that makes them even more worthless. The creature thought, as it charged forwards and began tearing the group of hounds to shreds. Minutes later, it was splitting off into an adjoining tunnel, searching for more easy entertainment. But the deeper SCP-682 made its way into the bowels of Level 2, the more it approached a truly horrifying realization. The creatures it was slaughtering here were even more boring than the ones the SCP Foundation ceaselessly threw at it back on its native reality, or at least the reality where they'd contained it. Back in that world, it had faced giant flaming demigods with swords hotter than the sun. It had faced some pale, shrieking monstrosity that didn't seem to die no matter what the reptile threw at it. There was the dark, gooey old man, the immortal warrior from the Black Coffin, and even the all-devouring bunny rabbit. Here it was killing the same wretched selection of beasts again and again, a truly pitiful offering. 
Was this really the best this world had to offer? Incidentally, the next creature it found was literally known as wretches by the human inhabitants of the backrooms. They were fleshy, zombie-like creatures that SCP-682 figured the Sarkists back home might enjoy. It couldn't believe that it was thinking fondly of that old place, while it carved the monsters to ribbons with its claws. It missed its old enemies, like Dr. Bright, Dr. Clef, and even that irritating yellow blob of snot. The more it tried to take its mind off the old world by killing its way through this ant farm of endless tunnels, the more it found itself waxing nostalgic. For example, there were the plague goblins, impish little creatures with masks like that of a plague doctor. 682 found itself thinking almost fondly about SCP-049, while it listlessly ate the tiny, mischievous creatures, like a depressed person binging an extra-large pack of chips. Even their tiny squeaks as they crunched between the reptile's terrible teeth gave it no joy. What a bleak turn of events this had all turned out to be. As it wandered through the infinite tunnels, killing creatures and even humans as it found them, SCP-682 made a quiet promise to itself. Somehow, some way, it would make its way back to the universe it so recently departed. It would leave the back rooms, no matter how many levels, a quiet, burning husk, and return to the world of fools and fiends it had taken for granted all this time. A visit to the back rooms had taught the hard to destroy reptile an all too human lesson. Sometimes you don't know what you have until it's gone. Sure, the SCP Foundation may have tried to kill it in a new, bizarre, and increasingly sadistic way every single day, but that variety was the spice of life. It would return home someday, it knew that much, but of course, a lot of creatures and people would need to die before then. But if that's what it took, well, so be it. SCP-682 licked its dagger-like fangs and kept crawling. A beloved, mentally unstable masked vigilante once said, I'm not trapped in here with you, you're trapped in here with me! And this exact sentiment was shared by SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, as it traversed the almost limitless, liminal hell known as the Backrooms. It'd been little more than a standard chase and secure mission for the mobile task forces pursuing SCP-682 after its latest deadly containment breach, until the vicious lizard made its way into an abandoned warehouse and no clipped its way into a new reality. As the SCP Foundation are still desperately searching for the missing beast back in our native reality, 682 has been discovering whole new vistas of violence. First, it found itself in the endless yellow halls of level zero, where if the madness doesn't get you, the starvation and thirst will. Well, unless you're an anomalous reptilian abomination that can seemingly adapt to any situation. Once 682 escaped this gaudy purgatory, it found its way into Level 1, an endless warehouse full of equal parts monsters and hapless human settlers, all of whom it decimated in a single bloody afternoon. Then on to Level 2, the Pipe Rooms, where it faced a bevy of beasts that it eagerly put into the ground. And that brings us up to now, and by extension, on to Level 3. SCP-682 spilled out into another section of long, industrial hallways. It didn't know how it had gotten in, and honestly, it didn't really care at this point. All it needed to do was keep moving forward and killing as it pleased, and it seemed there were plenty of creatures down here to kill. That being said, this level had a certain energy to it, and we mean that literally. 682's incredibly sensitive, well, senses allowed it to detect an incredibly powerful electrical field emanating from this level, and from the sounds of machines humming all around it, traveling down great bundles of wires and pipes bound to the walls, it knew that this level must have been attached to a generator of truly incredible size. It charged forward, weaving around the different hallways at freakish speeds, searching for the next thing it could blast into oblivion, and thankfully, it was able to find its first target soon enough, a nest of creatures known as Death Moths. These were huge, fluttering moths of freakish size congregating around a glowing electrical outlet. Intriguing. SCP-682 decided to approach and introduce itself. After all, they looked like pretty easy prey. 682 would regret this oversight. While the male death moths are pretty much harmless, the female death moths have an extremely potent defense mechanism. As SCP-682 approached, the creatures began swarming and spraying acid onto its reptilian flesh. 
This was painful and irritating for 682, of course. But if any entity on Earth is pretty accustomed to dealing with large quantities of powerful acid by now, it's SCP-682. Its skin quickly healed from the acidic onslaught, and it developed a powerful counter-adaption. A long, sticky, frog-like tongue, which it used to devour the nest full of death moths and move along to its next target. It continued exploring level 3. A number of hallways were marked off with metal bars. Another very familiar sight for SCP-682, so for simplicity's sake, it just kept itself to the unobstructed paths. That's where it soon ran into another life form, standing around like a sitting duck in one of the level's many anomalous hallways. It was just another human, in a similar outfit to all those major explorer group weaklings it had destroyed earlier. Strangely, even when SCP-682 entered the hallway with it, it didn't seem to react properly. It just vacantly stared off into space, stumbling around awkwardly. 682, bemused, whipped this random disoriented stranger in the chest with its tail, sending him sailing into the nearby wall. It was at this point that something strange happened. The force of the strike caused the man's clothes and also skin to disintegrate, leaving something entirely different underneath. SCP-682 had no idea what was going on, but it knew that it hated it. This was its first encounter with a creature known as a skin stealer. It would be natural for a human being to be terrified of an abomination like this. An apex predator like 682, on the other hand, it barely even found the skin stealer interesting. With a single stomp from its clawed reptilian foot, the creature was very, very dead and SCP-682 continued its journey through the bowels of Level 3. It found itself drawn to whatever the source of all the energy was, if it even had one single source. It was almost as though the entire level was one gigantic predator, powering the rest of the back rooms. And if there was electricity, perhaps there were other humans in here to kill. SCP-682 liked that idea very much indeed. However, while making its way down a slightly wider hallway, one that it had previously believed was completely uninhabited, it was suddenly ambushed by a group of mysterious attackers, a number of tall gray creatures with long, clawing arms and unclear facial features stepped away from the wall. These entities are known as the Dullers, ambush predators native to the back rooms. They normally run away from threats, but considering the number of them congregated in the hall around SCP-682, Perhaps they felt a little more confident about taking down their prey in a group. But they'd made a grave miscalculation. It would not matter whether there was one dollar or a thousand dollars. In the battle between them and SCP-682, they would always, always, always be the prey. But lucky for them, while they weren't aware of this immutable fact yet, SCP-682 was more than happy to give them a first-hand education. While the Dullers tried their best to claw into SCP-682's thick, leathery hide, the creature decided to employ a new ability it had stolen from the female death moths. Several new glands developed all over 682's body, each of which produced a fine mist of highly concentrated acid. Soon enough, the Dullers were howling in pain and melting away into dull gray puddles on the ground, never to reconstitute again. That's what you get for trying to climb up the food chain, folks. It never ends well. Unless you're 682, that is. After disposing of the Dullers, which in 682's own humble opinion had more than earned that title by indeed being extremely dull, it decided to continue its search for some of the power sources on this level. Perhaps it could harness this ability for its own benefit, but it was interrupted by what is, frankly, one of the grossest enemies in all of the back rooms, the Bursters. And if even hearing the name makes you feel a little sick, then you're correctly primed for what you're about to encounter. They're humanoid creatures that walk around on all fours, with its back legs grotesquely stretched out into the shape of a dog's hind legs. But that's nothing compared to the Burster's truly diabolical back knee. All over the creature's back, you can see huge, calloused cysts that contain a potent and noxious acid. Sure, the acid is only about as dangerous as the stuff produced by female death moths, but in our humble opinion, the method of acid delivery is far more repulsive, and that makes bursters less desirable to encounter. A small group of them skittered out of the darkness towards SCP-682. The hard-to-destroy reptile also found them disgusting, though now that we think about it, 
as CP682 thinks all forms of life are disgusting, so we suppose that it's all relative. However, when they began to burst their backs and coat 682 in their horrible pus, they perhaps earned the rarely given label of extra disgusting from this living embodiment of reptilian hate. 682 quickly retaliated by clawing the horrid creatures to death, which I think we can all agree is a good and well-deserving ending for the vile little beasts. We would have done the same thing. The next enemies that 682 encountered weren't nightmarish creatures, but in fact were human beings stationed in the major explorer group's base Gamma, the third most important base in all of the back rooms. They were on high alert after losing contact with base Alpha several days before. Having no idea that everyone at that base had been slaughtered by SCP-682, a fate that, if they weren't tremendously lucky, they would soon share. But they had little more than luck on their side this time. SCP-682 sighted the base on the end of a long hallway. There was even a person standing at the other end of the hall, seemingly blissfully aware of the encroaching presence of one of the SCP Foundation's most dangerous and formidable captives. 682 loved killing humans most of all. They weren't just dumb animals. They had the intellectual capacity to actually appreciate the life that was being ripped away from them, and it made the whole act even more pleasurable for SCP-682. It set its sights on the ignorant Major Explorer group member leaning against the distant wall and decided to charge for him. Claws extended and fangs bared, this would be such easy prey until the moment when someone in the distance yelled, NOW, and the seemingly defenseless human turned around and pulled a lever on the wall. Suddenly, the whole hallway was electrified, sending millions of volts coursing through SCP-682's writhing body. This whole thing had been an elaborate trap. The humans at Base Gamma hadn't survived this long in the back rooms by being stupid. The more technically savvy members had rewired some of the hallways to channel the immense energy of the generators and fry any unfortunate entities that tried to use these hallways to break into Base Gamma. There was one big problem, though. SCP-682 wasn't just any unfortunate entity. While it did initially look like electricity might fry the beast, it gradually began channeling the electricity into its own body and developing the capacity to re-gift this electricity to the people who so kindly provided it. SCP-682, now a crackling conduit of electricity, leaped from the shocking hallway and into Base Gamma. Soon enough, it had fatally electrocuted all 300 members of the major explorer group posted in Base Gamma and returned to its baseline state. Level 3 had grown tiresome now. It seemed that there were no more exciting new creatures to massacre. As a result, 682 slid into a nearby elevator and went down, where a new level awaited. This was how SCP-682 got to level 4. And level 4 was not what the Heart to Destroy Reptile expected. In contrast to the industrial nightmare of the previous few levels, level 4 was like a limitless office block, with all the furniture ripped out. While for some this might represent the crushing existential banality of office life, and how the wheels of capitalism inevitably work us all to death, SCP-682 had never worked in an office before, so it didn't really have the proper cultural reference points to appreciate this more abstract kind of fear. It wanted monsters to kill. 682 spent approximately six days searching around the hellscape that is level 4, not discovering a single person or entity while it was there. It was honestly the most stressed that SCP-682 had felt since coming here. The beast was almost tempted to unscrew a light bulb from above, draw a little face on it, begin referring to it as Wilson, and then kill it. 682 felt the closest emotion it could manage to immense gratitude when it sighted the glowing green of a distant exit sign at the end of a long hallway, finally a way out onto another level. Hopefully this one would have more creatures to slaughter. Welcome, SCP-682, to level 5. SCP-682 didn't really know what to expect from the next level of the back rooms. After all, it all seemed pretty random so far, but it definitely didn't expect to see a classy, well-appointed hotel on the other end of the hallway. SCP-682 had never seen the Stanley Kubrick masterpiece The Shining, nor read the book it was based on by Master of Horror Stephen King, but if it had, it would probably have drawn the comparison. Instead, it was already busy tearing through the ornate halls, looking for new prey to slaughter. 
The first unexpected encounter was with a small cat that casually wandered out into the hallway right in front of it. The cat, who didn't seem threatened by SCP-682, said, Hi, I'm Samantha. You got any meat you can lend me? I'll tell you your fortune if you do. SCP-682 was, frankly, baffled. It took a moment to formulate a reply. You worthless creature. You have no idea what you're dealing with, do you? I'm going to bring this place to ruin and destroy all who reside within. 682 said, So, uh, no meat then? 682 growled and swiped at the cat with its claws. Luckily, she was able to dodge. The cat tutted and padded away into the darkness, muttering, Go bother the beast instead, jerk. This piqued SCP-682's interest. A beast, you say? Sounds important. Sounds powerful. Finally, a worthy opponent. Our battle shall be legendary. And with renewed vigor, SCP-682 began prowling the halls of the back rooms, searching for this beast to defeat and destroy. But to begin with, things were grievously disappointing. One of the first monsters on this opulent hotel level that the hard-to-destroy reptile faced were diminutive little rodents known as death rats, which were effectively slightly larger than normal rats with little horns. SCP-682 stomped them all with ease, its thoughts dripping with disdain for their truly pathetic weakness. What kind of hotel allows itself to be filled with rats? Even by human standards, this would be disgraceful. Soon after, SCP-682 encountered a few familiar foes, female death moths and hounds, all as easy to kill as they were before. SCP-682 didn't understand. The feline promised that there was a beast down here. Was it hiding from the mighty reptile like a filthy coward? <laughs> Worthless. But it was in the depths of this cynicism that SCP-682 encountered a growler. First it heard the sound of animalistic growling projected directly into its mind, getting louder and louder by the moment. Then as the growling grew in volume, 682 heard the thunderous footsteps of a huge quadruped getting closer. 682 wondered, as the roaring became almost deafening, whether this sounded heralded the approach of the beast. However, the second the monster actually turned the corner and came into view, 682 had to suppress the urge to laugh. It was one of the most absurd things it had ever seen. It looked like a giant pile of pipe cleaners, in every color imaginable, arranged into a vaguely four-legged structure. This was the monster producing all that psychic racket? <laughs> Pathetic. SCP-682 resolved in that moment to show the monster how it was done. SCP-682 immediately evolved its own psychic emission capacitors within its brain and projected the message, You are a worthless little creature, directly into the simple mind of the growler. It began to quake in horror at the booming of 682's voice in its brain. What was this terrifying new creature? It didn't understand. And just like that, 682, who had grown bored of this one-sided psychic battle, turned up the strength of the psychic beam by a factor of 50. The sudden psychic blast was so powerful that the Growler collapsed to the ground and burst into flames, burning itself away into nothingness in a matter of moments, just as weak as 682 had expected. Hopefully the beast would provide a greater challenge, because this was just getting sad. SCP-682 shook off the disappointment and continued running through the halls of the hotel. Eventually, after passing through some dull dance hall called the Beverly Room, 682 found itself running through a hallway full of long portraits. Every person in the portraits had a strange, twisted grin on their face. Not that this even registered to SCP-682. What did occur to 682, though, was the figure that suddenly materialized in the hallway in front of it. It was a strange figure, to be sure, an entity in a suit with a large blue cuttlefish for a head. The creature cleared its throat and began to speak. Well, hello there. You're new here, aren't you? Hmm, such an interesting creature. You've been making some trouble on the other levels, haven't you? <laughs> Not that it's any of my business. On the contrary, dear sir, I like the cut of your jib. How would you feel about joining me in the hotel business? It isn't easy to manage this dimension by myself, after all. How about you and I come into my office? We can work out the terms of our... 682 lunged forward and unceremoniously devoured the creature's head, allowing its dapperly dressed body to fall limply to the ground, dead. SCP-682 grunted, 
annoyed by the distraction the creature had provided. It had better things to do. This beast has got to be around here somewhere. It seemed that the Foundation was all but rid of SCP-682 after an unlikely glitch in reality sent the hard-to-destroy reptile deep into a limitless interdimensional abyss known simply as the Back Rooms. This meant that the standard reality, also known as the Front Rooms, was safe from one of the most dangerous monsters in existence, but that didn't mean the anomaly was neutralized. SCP-682 had been slowly but surely making its way through every level of the back rooms and taking out its aggression on any living thing that crossed its path. Well, except for Jerry. There was something about the entity, which resembled Blue Hyacinth Macaw, that had made it tolerable to SCP-682, which was rare for the reptile, as it infamously regarded most other life forms as disgusting and worthy only to be destroyed. Jerry had been frightened away by an encounter with the archers of level 10, and ever since SCP-682 had been looking for the little guy. This search eventually led the creature to backtrack through the suburbs of level 9 and enter level 11, the presumably infinite city. This was the largest settlement that SCP-682 had seen in the back rooms, and whether or not it found its avian companion, it was eager to cause some havoc among the locals. And speaking of the locals, what a sorry sight they were. Countless facelings were acting like ordinary humans going about their day, strolling down the sidewalks and entering buildings, seemingly with no reason other than to humor the themed environment. A few of the facelings were even walking hounds on leashes, in a grotesque pantomime of a dog walker. 682 was infuriated. Somehow, in its seemingly infinite ways of causing the creature distress, the backrooms had managed to combine the two things that annoyed it most, the so-called civilized creatures of its native reality, and the equally disgusting entities that dwelled within the backrooms. Unable to stand to look at this any longer, SCP-682 went on a violent rampage, attacking every entity in sight. Its previous objective of seeking Jerry no longer mattered to it, as the anomalies discussed for every part of this alternate reality overwhelmed all of its thoughts. If 682 found itself starring in Pixar's Inside Out, all of the emotions in its mind would be variations of disgust. As the body started to pile up, SCP-682 began to sense something in the airwaves of this level. It soon adapted a long-range radio antenna in order to better pick up the frequency. The voice on the other was calm and sounded like a middle-aged human male. You're listening to Radio Backrooms, the voice said. If you're just tuning in now, welcome to Talkin' with Ralph. I'm your host, Ralph. There you are, SCP-682 said, triangulating the radio signal with its internal senses. This Ralph character was going to be next to die. Well, he would be next, if nothing else with a dumb look about it got in the way. And in the back rooms, the chances were high that a new pathetic creature for SCP-682 to destroy would be around every corner. Either way, 682 marked the new waypoint on its mental map and started to zero in on Ralph's location. Looks like we got ourselves a brand new entity in level 11, Ralph's voice echoed in SCP-682's skull. I'll be giving away a free time slot to whichever faction bags the beast within the next 12 hours. SCP-682 realized almost immediately that it must have been the new entity that Ralph was referring to. It was familiar with the idea of factions within the back rooms because of its previous encounters with the major explorers group, but now the situation threatened to get interesting. Maybe there would be some factions here with actual combat training on par with the mobile task forces. Could these new factions pose a challenge to such a powerful Keter class anomaly? 682 heard the buzzing of tiny propellers overhead and saw a group of surveillance drones flying towards it. With cat-like agility, it leaped into the air and swatted the drones with its limbs and claws. The cheap hunks of carbon fiber were shattered easily. Halfway across the city, several members of the drone surveillance squad were throwing their headsets on the ground in frustration. With one faction having missed its chance, the next was quick to arrive. Five cool teens on bikes and skateboards rolled up to the end of the street. They were all dressed in 80s fashion for some reason. Check it out! That's one righteous reptile! Said one of the teens. Gnarly! Said another. 682 cringed. 
Even with its limited understanding of human culture, it could tell that 80s nostalgia was overplayed, and that the era of 90s and 2000s nostalgia would soon arrive. And what better way to hasten it than getting these troubled teens off the street? Just don't ask where they went after that. Another so-called faction down in SCP-682 was already feeling uncontested. So far, these humans were even less intimidating than the entities. This was a bit mind-boggling to SCP-682, considering that the Foundation was made up of humans and they had managed to bag several much scarier anomalies than anything in the back rooms. Naturally, SCP-682 included itself among that number. The radio studio we're talking with Ralph was broadcasting from was getting ever closer. Taking a slight detour, the reptile tore straight through Level 11's MEG base of operations. Once again, the explorers within proved to be no match for the creature. It emerged on the other side of the building, back into the city streets, and was immediately confronted with several new explorers. These humans weren't exactly 80s fashionable, opting instead for tactical gear and long black cloaks. They had a haunted look about them, and each carried a mighty spear. Sinner! They shouted in unison. The eyes of Argos are upon you! SCP-682 pounced and made short work of them, but paused warily when it noticed the presence of a slightly taller humanoid that had been standing behind the group. It was dressed the same as the humans, but it had an aura of mythic fury. The humanoid had no eyes, but somehow, SCP-682 could feel itself being watched, as if from all places at once. It was unsettling for the creature, as it felt like being back at the Foundation. Contained in a vat of acid while a science lab full of researchers watched and judged. Yes, judged. That was the feeling, and SCP-682 knew it all too well. The humanoid stepped forward, brandishing its spear. What was it with this place and spears? SCP-682 wondered. The powerful entity it had fought on Level 7 had also wielded the spear. Was that weapon meant to be some indication that this one was just as tough? I am all-seeing Argos, and I have seen that your sins are innumerable, said the humanoid entity. Argos lunged forward, thrusting with its spear towards SCP-682. The reptile received the brunt of the strike and was launched backward. Without even giving 682 time to recover, Argos thrust its spear through the creature, pinning it to the concrete. Sinners must be punished, Argos bellowed, pushing the spear deeper into the reptile's body. SCP-682 struck back with a bite, but to its surprise, Argos seemed to have an impossibly high tolerance for pain, and its wounds seemed to be healing almost as soon as they opened. This told 682 that close-range attacks wouldn't get this entity's spear out of its back. It needed to get the freaky humanoid out of spear range, and then hit back with a reach weapon of its own. Tapping once again into the radio frequencies, 682 levied a blast of concussive sonic energy from its body. While this didn't damage Argos, it did achieve the intended effect of knocking the entity a few feet back. SCP-682 used this chance to get a bit of distance and readied its next weapon, its own reptilian tail, now elongated and equipped with a sharp blade at the end. In terms of reach, SCP-682's tail whip outclassed Argos's spear, the battle was on now. 682 swung its powerful blade in an attempt to cut through the enemy's weapon, but it seemed that the spear had the same regenerative abilities as its wielder. You're not human, SCP-682 taunted Argos. You're even more disgusting! You are a sinner, Argos replied. Regeneration was one of SCP-682's strong suits, too, and the spear wounds that Argos had given it had already recovered. Using the bladed whip of its tail, SCP-682 kept Argos and his spear out of close quarters. It continued to slash the entity, but the wounds were healing too quickly to leave an impression. Argos was also skilled enough with his spear that he began to deflect the whip and advance toward 682. It was time to try something crazy. So crazy, it just might work. Argos stopped in his tracks, as suddenly, SCP-682 was nowhere to be found. The reptile had become effectively invisible, and this was because it had adapted to counter Argos's true vision. Now encased in a ghostly aura of sin-cloaking energy, SCP-682 maneuvered around Argos and prepared to finish it off. If you're like me, then this won't bring you down, but it will hurt Argos. 
and I will enjoy it. Calling upon the memories of the acid vats back at the Foundation, SCP-682 secreted a powerful acid across its entire body and leapt onto Argos's back. The thing about spears is, while they are ideal for engaging the opponent at a distance, they were far less useful if that same opponent was grappling your limbs. With his weapon rendered unusable, Argos was now locked in a battle of endurance with SCP-682. It had generated the most powerful acid it could generate, potent enough to even cause a bit of damage to itself. It's over, Argos. SCP-682 chuckled. You may be good at fighting, but only one of us has spent years being contained within a caustic prison. You lose. SCP-682 held down Argos for as long as it took for the acid to fully immobilize him. The entity had struggled to break free, but 682 was able to continually grow strong enough to tighten its grip. With the boss of this level destroyed, SCP-682 continued towards the radio tower. Um, congratulations, you, Ralph said over the radio. You win, lizard man. How about you and I have a nice, peaceful chat? Not having any of this, SCP-682 beamed its own words into the radio station along the same frequency. Tell me how to get to the next level, and I'll consider sparing you, but only because you're that worthless. Haha, <laughs> I hear you, lizard man! Ralph responded nervously. Ralph directed SCP-682 to a specific window inside of one of the nearby skyscrapers. When SCP-682 opened this window, it was immediately transported into a cramped white room with a table that had a single chair nearby. This was level 12. SCP-682 was most assuredly going back for Ralph later. Yet another level seemed specifically created to play on the ennui of the human condition, which was something that 682 still had no frame of reference for. Humans were afraid of the stupidest things, 682 thought to itself. It waited in this white room for what felt like several hours, until it was eventually no-clipped back into level 11. Ralph! SCP-682 roared, loud enough to shatter the glass windows on several buildings in the Infinite City. It charged out of the skyscraper and onto the roof of a nearby apartment building, which just so happened to be another surface with no-clip capabilities. 682 never got to hear a response back from the talk radio host before it fell several stories down into another level of the back rooms entirely. Level 13. An apartment building that, while not technically infinite, was presumed to have a very high number of floors. The hallways were more cramped than the hotel on level 5, so SCP-682 shrunk itself a bit to avoid getting stuck. It gritted its teeth and prepared for the usual routine. Three. Two, one. A clump, a female moth, and a hound came slinking down the hallway, like a random encounter in a JRPG. SCP-682 hated these backrooms entities so very much, and could barely fathom why they could stand each other. It seemed that no matter what level these hostile entities appeared, the goon squad only ever attacked creatures that weren't native to the backrooms. Without further deliberation, 682 ran the Three Stooges over, Trampling them with its superior powers, it was more than done taking small fry seriously, and that included Curly, Larry, and Moe. As it wandered through the halls, SCP-682 started to hear the droning, easy-listening music which pervaded this entire level. It was the sort of sound that humans used in elevators and grocery stores, places where the dull mundanity of life was meant to serve as a comfort, and yet it seemed to be the soundtrack of the backroom's latest hellish level. In a way, 682 started to feel pity for the humans trapped here, not because their suffering was a bad thing from its perspective, but because of the fragility of their finite psyches. If whatever forces that created the backrooms did intend it to be a realm that tormented humans, the humans were definitely making it too easy. And if humans themselves made this to contain other humans, the implications were even sillier. When the very structures that humans built to shelter themselves from the elements, apartment buildings, cities, towns, were able to cause this much fear in them, it was a sure sign that humanity was always doomed to retreat screaming back into the wilderness after centuries of learning nothing from its collective delusion of civilization. Or at least they would be doomed to that fate if they weren't already doomed to be wiped out by SCP-682, just like every entity in the backrooms. 
682 wouldn't rest until every last faceling, clump, death moth, death rat, smiler, hound, duller, burster, and any other ridiculous entity that dared to crawl through these wretched corridors was personally sent to its end. It got so pumped up thinking about this that it didn't even notice itself no clipping again. Thousands of floors rushed by in the blink of a moment until the reptile finally dropped through the lobby of the apartment building. A new level unlocked, just like that. SCP-682 regained its bearings on a forest floor covered in a vibrant crimson grass. The trees had pitch black bark, almost blending in with the night itself. The sky above was a glistening sea of bright stars. This was level 14, known to most explorers as Paradise. This level had a strange power which supposedly made the explorer happy and feeling as though they belonged. However, much like the darkness within the suburbs, Level 14's happiness-inducing atmosphere would have the opposite effect on the hard-to-destroy reptile. It hated this forest even more than any previous level of the backrooms and wanted out immediately. From experience, 682 knew that poking around would eventually result in it finding the entrance to the next level, so it hightailed its way through the trees. It needed to find that exit desperately. As it ran through the woods, 682 could hear howling somewhere far in the distance, and it didn't sound like a pack of wild animals. Disturbingly, it sounded like a crowd of humans attempting noises similar to wolves, but they were committing so much to the performance that it almost seemed like they truly believed they were wolves. Whatever hippy-dippy nonsense was going on here wasn't SCP-682's concern. Right now, it was burning with so much contempt for level 14, that it could barely think straight. Its feet crashed through a field of pale white bones, lying just beneath the grass, but it kept on running. It collided with a tree, downing it in a second, but it just kept running. The howling ceased in the distance, and still SCP-682 continued to run as fast and as far as it could. Then, against all odds, the creature's own mind began to turn against it as the effect of level 14 continued to take hold. You don't belong anywhere. You are a mistake of nature. SCP-682 could recognize its own voice echoing in its head, and for the first time, it was terrified of itself. You are a thing that cannot ever be happy. This paradise will never accept you. Nowhere will ever accept you. You are disgusting. SCP-682 froze in its tracks. There was no exit from this place. The backrooms had won the sick game it was playing with the reptile's existence. It would be trapped here forever in this inverted paradise for humans, a self-loathing immortal without any hope of escape. It was so paralyzed by the immense disgust that it felt for itself that it almost didn't notice a speck of blue amongst all the red, the blue on the feathers of a hyacinth macaw. Jerry, SCP-682 said aloud, don't follow him. You are a monster. You will never know companionship or love. Shut up, you disgusting creature! SCP-682 growled back at its own mind. Shakily, it began to move its legs in the direction of Jerry. The bird-like entity was the only thing that still felt real about level 14. Everything practically faded away into a churning ocean of red and black. It took every ounce of willpower that SCP-682 had but it kept moving towards Jerry. You are the most disgusting monster to ever exist. The Foundation should have destroyed you. The Backrooms will destroy you. You don't belong in this world. SCP-682 did everything it could to shut out the voice, even as Jerry took off and flew deeper into the crimson forests of level 14. Without even realizing, 682 had grown a pair of blue wings of its own, it followed Jerry through the trees and then higher toward the starry sky. One thought cut all the negativity that had been swirling through SCP-682's mind. It doesn't matter if I don't belong anywhere else. Jerry is all I need. A light shone down from above, and suddenly it was as if level 14 itself was rejecting SCP-682. While the reptile was focused on Jerry, a piece of the sky seemed to glitch and then as if it were a solid piece of machinery, it fell down toward the red grass below. Behind the fallen chunk of sky was a metallic hallway, not unlike some of those back at the Foundation. 
Jerry flew through the opening, and SCP-682 followed with its own macaw-like feathered wings. A shift in gravity, much like the event on Level 7, occurred, and 682 soon found itself standing inside of a long, silvery corridor, having come through a hole in the ceiling. Goodbye, Level 14. Hello, Level 15. The Futuristic Hallways. Oh yeah, the future rules. Here we are in the future. And it's right, it was certainly a lot less of a personal nightmare to SCP-682. Jerry had clearly flown ahead, but 682 knew somewhere deep down that it wouldn't have made it here without him. If the reptile had any respect for the concept of fairness, it probably considered the debt for Jerry fleeing in level 10 to be repaid. But its empathy wasn't quite so sophisticated that it could weigh favors like that. So it soldiered on, looking to catch up with Jerry for no particular reason, at least as far as it knew. The hallways were definitely man-made in appearance, but from a time so technologically advanced that even the Foundation couldn't dream of it. The best part about Level 15 was that it was filled with what appeared to be human remains. Most of these corpses were marked with knife and gunshot wounds, perhaps the result of some kind of mass slaughter. Either way, it was clear that all of these humans had been dead for a long time. The only good human is a dead human. SCP-682 mused to itself. It seemed that the future did, in fact, kind of rule. Because from SCP-682's perspective, Level 15 was populated entirely by, quote, good humans. There was still no sign of Jerry, but there were also no annoying entities to waste the reptile's time. Compared to Level 14, the futuristic hallways were the real paradise. While it was as far away as ever from feeling any kind of authentic contentment, SCP-682 decided that this place was acceptable. No life, no foundation. I'm starting to like it here. The eight long pointed legs of a massive spider, fangs dripping with deadly venom, skitter across the ground. It is one of the apex predators here, until it's crushed by the scaly foot of SCP-682, the backroom's newest, angriest resident. When we last left our least favorite anomalous reptile, SCP-682 was eight levels deep into the terrifying extra-dimensional labyrinth known as the Backrooms. With SCP-343 knows how many levels left to traverse, the hard-to-destroy reptile was beginning to feel a bubbling sense of contempt for everything in this godforsaken reality. That is to say, SCP-682 felt this way it usually felt, but for once there was no feeble Foundation personnel to unleash its rage on. And while its long absence back in the world outside of the backrooms has been seen as a stressful inconvenience for most of the Foundation, the fact that the Keter-class creature had done no further harm since it evaded containment had led many researchers to believe that, however unlikely it was, SCP-682 no longer existed. It's out of our hair, said one Dr. Wazowski. Though the Foundation would continue to launch around-the-clock reconnaissance missions the world over, the mobile task force that seemingly did the deed of destroying the hard-to-destroy reptile was currently being treated to a company pizza party, paid for by the Foundation's Sorry a Lizard Ate Your Loved One fund, which received a small donation from the O5 Council every time that SCP-682 breached containment. But there was no chance of relief for SCP-682 itself, as wandering through the back rooms without a map or strong sense of purpose was certainly no pizza party. Level 8 the level that SCP-682 currently found itself on was a cave system crawling with all manner of hostile entities. Well, hostile for weak and pathetic human beings, at least. To say the same was true for SCP-682 would be a gross distortion of the definition of the word hostile, especially because SCP-682 had faced many of these miserable monstrosities before on the previous levels. The clumps, hounds, death rats, and smilers were back in droves, and these now all too familiar entities seemingly couldn't help themselves from aggressively pouncing on SCP-682 the second that the reptile entered their line of sight. Not that getting the drop on the anomaly would buy them any advantage, as SCP-682 effortlessly bodied them one after another. Playing the hits already, backrooms. SCP-682 thought to itself, at least give me something new to chew on. 
Through the jumble of stalactites and stalagmites, SCP-682 could see a child faceling standing on the other side of an unusual pit of tar. The last time that SCP-682 encountered a few of these unfittingly named faceless little girls during its time on Level 2, it had ignored the entities out of a sense that there would be more interesting monsters to destroy going forward. SCP-682 now realized, almost shamefully, that it had largely been proven wrong. Perhaps the child facelings were in fact more than meets the eye, or knew something that the other entities didn't. Regardless, there were never enough pathetic cretins in the back rooms for SCP-682 to vent its nigh-limitless frustration on. The small faceling would simply be the next to bite the dust. Or so SCP-682 thought. As the hard-to-destroy reptile charged towards the entity, its claws touched down on the puddle of tar, and almost immediately, a countless number of human hands emerged from the liquid beneath and pulled 682 under. The anomaly was able to easily adapt the level of strength necessary to escape from the grasp of the tar pit entities and resurface. When it emerged, however, the child faceling was nowhere to be found. SCP-682 had given the creepy little menace some credit, as it was apparently smarter than the other entities which had crossed the lizard's path. SCP-682 put as much distance between itself and that annoying tar pit as it could, and it was vigilant for any other similar hazards. Not especially amused by the concept of being swallowed up again, SCP-682 adapted a pair of large draconic wings which it used to carry itself aloft through the caves of level 8. From above, the anomaly could see a number of foot-long centipede-like entities, as well as entities that resembled eyeless chickens, and for once, neither of these horrendous mistakes of creation seemed interesting in assaulting SCP-682. It was surprising, but SCP-682 actually felt a little bit relieved. Not because it felt remotely threatened by anything that crawled, trotted, or slung through the back rooms, but because it didn't have to waste any of its valuable time putting down another weakling that should know better. This relief was short-lived as all of a sudden, a large shape dropped down on SCP-682 from the ceiling. This monstrous humanoid boasted four powerful limbs, and was currently using all of them in an attempt to pummel SCP-682 back down to the ground. 682 could see several similar entities emerging from nearby cavern walls, having apparently blended in through color-changing camouflage, and lying completely still in wait for prey, or in the case of SCP-682, the anomalous lizard that would prey on them. These entities are called camo crawlers by the Major Explorer Group, and because they have the same level of intelligence as regular humans and cooperate to hunt in packs, they are regarded as one of the most difficult entities to deal with. Not for SCP-682, of course, and the hateful beast could not be more disappointed in this latest ill-conceived ambush. SCP-682 came to a landing on part of the cavern floor, which was decidedly not covered with tar, and allowed its wings to retract back to its body. Without a moment to spare, it quickly made short work of the camo crawlers. The lot of them may have been as smart as humans, but SCP-682 had killed a lot of humans in its time, and an extra pair of arms wasn't exactly a game-changer. Now surrounded by a record number of expired backrooms entities, SCP-682 realized it was growing sick of level 8. It seemed that there was no winning with this place, as the levels that SCP-682 had visited previously either contained hordes of worthless expendable fodder, like this one, or were so empty that the SCP would find itself longing for any kind of interaction. It was time to search for an exit to this level, with the hope that the next inconceivably vast maze of nothingness had a more refreshing flavor to it. Knowing the back rooms, the exit to level 8 would probably come in the form of an off-color portion of the cave wall, or some glitched geometry straight out of those video games that younger humans seem to love to play. Fortunately, SCP-682 didn't have to think too hard about how to progress to the next level, as after wandering around for long enough, it merely fell straight through a random section of the floor into darkness. Seconds later, SCP-682 appeared in the lamppost-lit streets of level 9, also known as the Infinite Suburb. It looked close to midnight, and much like in Michael Jackson's hit song Thriller, evil things were no doubt lurking in the dark. But none more evil than the hard-to-destroy reptile itself. If Level 9 was anything like the suburbs that SCP-682 remembered from its native reality, this place should be filled with humans packed together like sardines in a can. 
And while the Lucky Foundation Mobile Task Force that was present at the site SCP-682 had now clipped into the backrooms at were likely enjoying some sardine pizza for a job well done, SCP-682 was fixing to make the next humans it encountered into its own kind of unconventional topping for a feast. It was feeling oddly rejuvenated and almost happy again, but what it didn't know was that the darkness of Level 9 had the same anomalous, or I suppose vaguely supernatural, properties of Level 6. And as the research suggests, many kinds of emotional inversion fields that unnerve and disturb ordinary humans make SCP-682 feel the opposite way. It was strange, but somehow SCP-682 felt almost like it belonged here in suburbia. Just a little old me in a big, big world. SCP-682 mused to itself before trotting down the pavement through the neighborhood. Its mouth was starting to water as it carefully deliberated over which of these sleepy community homes it would enter first. The idea that behind every door there were unsuspecting humans fresh for the slaughter made this place seem like a paradise for the reptile. This rare good mood even remained as a new group of quote-unquote hostile entities made their way down the street towards SCP-682. All right then, let's meet the welcoming committee. These entities were known as the Neighborhood Watch, and the most relatively interesting thing about their appearance was that their anatomy seemed to be centered around singularly massive eyeballs. Without hesitation, one of these cyclopean entities, a floating eyeball known as Watcher, fired a piercing ray of light at SCP-682, which instantly disintegrated portions of the reptile's body on contact. Unlike the corrosive acid used by the death moss and the ugh, bursters from level 5, God, the damage inflicted on SCP-682 was at the atomic level. What this effectively meant is that the regeneration time to recover from these injuries was going to be slightly longer than usual. The other advantage that the Watchers had was strength in numbers, as it were three of them as well as a pair of striders, ambulatory eyeballs on eight-foot legs which brought up the rear of the neighborhood watch. Two can play at that game, said SCP-682. It instantly copied the Watcher's disintegration rays, firing a pair of atomic lasers from both eyes that would make a superhuman blush. These lasers of heat and light hit their marks with perfect accuracy and dismantled particles of the entire approaching neighborhood watch. As per usual, the backrooms then proceeded to roll out the usual clown car of stooges. SCP-682 could see death moths, a couple skin stealers, and some particularly wretched wretches hiding amongst the suburban homes. The reptile made a sport of using its newly adapted laser vision to pick them off one by one. Zap! I see you! Zap! Before long, there were no more backrooms entities in sight, and SCP-682 decided that it was time to break into one of the homes on the street and go to town. Or technically, go to suburbia. Honey, I'm home! SCP-682 thought to itself as it smashed through the front door of one of the buildings. Inside was no trace of habitation. No food, no photographs, and absolutely no humans. Oh well, thought 682, still mellowed out from the effects of the darkness. There's always next door. It exited through the hole in the wall it made and strode across the lawn to the next little house on the square. Knock knock, SCP-682 burst in once more and found this house to be much the same state as the last. Undaunted and feeling persistent, SCP-682 made its way down the street like a terrifying door-to-door -door salesman, bursting through the front door of every house in its path. Telegram! Special delivery! I'm here to talk to you about your car's insurance! There was nothing. No humans anywhere. Level 9 seemed to be one big, empty ghost town. SCP-682 started to consider the implications of the number of entities it had encountered earlier. While they were little more than distractions for 682, the chances were very slim that any humans that had made it this far could have survived such a plethora of dime store goofballs. SCP-682 let out an uncharacteristically wistful sigh. The black rones have me all messed up. I can't believe I'm actually missing those disgusting humans. I've grown accustomed to their faces. SCP-682 reflected on this for a moment and then had another realization. No, this is perfect. I'm free. I may never see these worthless creatures again. They'll never inflict their pathetic existence on what is mine. 
I am free. SCP-682 howled in private triumphant victory as it rambled through the streets of this dead world unknown to humans and especially unknown to the Foundation. This was nothing like the endless office spaces of Level 4 because the darkness negated any possible depression that SCP-682 could develop as a result of being deprived of other entities to interact with. Even then, it was clear that there would be more than enough entities for SCP-682 to destroy if it got bored. While there was no telling how often entities in the back room spawn or where they really come from, there never seemed to be a shortage in the levels where they did exist. SCP-682 began to think that Level 9 was in fact the paradise it appeared to be at first glance. Against all odds, SCP-682 had achieved genuine bliss, and it seemed that nothing could take that away. As SCP-682 stood there, staring up into the starless black void of Level 9's sky, it was caught off guard by the sudden presence of what appeared to be a blue hyacinth macaw landing on its back. The bird had given no indication that it was nearby, and because of that, it had somehow taken SCP-682 completely by surprise. What's more, the reptile was feeling an unusual sensation within its mind. It knew almost instinctively that this avian entity's name was Jerry, and also it was one of the only beings 682 had ever encountered that it didn't outright want to destroy. It wasn't that SCP-682 liked Jerry or even really cared for if he lived or died, there was something about this unusual macabre that didn't trigger the usual disgust response that every other form of life brought out in 682. This wasn't admiration or friendship, but more like optimistic indifference. Your existence is acceptable, Jerry, said 682 to its newfound winged companion. Let's go find some weaklings to kill. What? Weaklings? Jerry replied. And so 682 was off again, this time with Jerry in tow. It was like the two of them against the world, and together they could take on anything. SCP-682 and Jerry out on adventures, running around and accomplishing great things in the back rooms. 100 years of SCP-682 and Jerry. Eventually, the asphalt and suburban houses gave way to an unpaved dirt path leading through a field of wheat. Within moments, the darkness was replaced with a dense fog, and the black of the night sky changed into the gray of a cloudy afternoon. SCP-682 breathed in the moist air and realized once again it had moved between levels of the back rooms without knowing it. This was level 10, the infinite wheat field. At this point, the word infinite was starting to feel cheap. Some warning would have been nice. SCP-682 grumbled, no longer feeling as serene without the benefits of level 9's darkness. At least Jerry was still here. There was a silver lining to everything. No! SCP-682 stomped its feet on the ground in building frustration. It needed to find something to tear to pieces immediately, or it might reconsider even its tolerance to Jerry. The macaw was now its last resort in case there was no other entities on this level. Fortunately for Jerry, SCP-682 became alerted by the echoing sounds of trumpets coming from further into the wheat field and decided to investigate. Through the mists of level 10, SCP-682 could see the silhouettes of several large stone towers. SCP-682 didn't recognize the exact time period of the architecture, the way a human might assume they were from the Middle Ages, but it could definitely tell that these were old. It hadn't destroyed something like this in ages and it seemed as though it would soon be given a reason to. Perched high on the towers were a small patrol of goblinoid creatures, wielding bows and arrows. These entities spotted SCP-682 around the same time it spotted them, and began to knock arrows from their quivers and open fire relentlessly on the reptile. These ancient projectiles stung, but compared to the disintegration rays from the Watchers, SCP-682 saw this as a bit of a downgrade. The only real harm that it did to SCP-682 was spiritual, as the rain of arrows seemed to startle Jerry and cause the macaw to take flight away from SCP-682. Jerry, get back here, you coward! SCP-682 shouted to the bird-like entity as it disappeared from sight. It shook its head, however brief it was. It seemed that the SCP-682 and Jerry team-up had come to an end. Stupid bird. He better hope I don't see him again. The archers continued to pepper SCP-682 with arrows, but the reptile wasn't about to take medieval warfare lying down. 
with extreme speed, SCP-682 charged at the nearest tower and rammed it head-on. The impact shook the structure, causing the archers to stumble and drop some of their arrows. Despite the damage, the tower hadn't fully crumbled, so SCP-682 underwent a brand new adaptation to settle the score. Armored plates converged at the end of SCP-682's tail, forming a large bludgeoning club similar to that of an Ankylosaurus. With the power and speed of 682's body behind it, this bony mass was more accurately described as a wrecking ball. And it came in like a wrecking ball too, as the reptile swung its whole body with enough force to smash the base of the tower into pieces. As the stone fell, so did the archers, and many were buried beneath the rubble while others scattered, retreating to farther towers while taking pot shots at 682. The reptile didn't chase them, it had bigger plans. It waited until the archers had made their way into the next few towers before grabbing a piece of rubble in its mouth and chucking it directly up into the air. The chunk of stone flew upwards and then began to descend rapidly towards the wheat field below. Demonstrating an eye for precision on par with the siege engineers of medieval times, SCP-682 swung its club tail at the perfect moment to hit the falling stone and change its course. It was a home run. SCP-682 scored a direct hit on the top of the next tower and repeated its stone-chucking strategy until the archers began to get the message. This was a war the likes of which these Freddy Freaker-looking demons had never experienced. The hard-to-destroy reptile roared a blustering battle cry and began to berate the entities for their weakness. You miscreants deserve this for scaring Jerry away! SCP-682 said without really thinking. What had gotten into it? Some strange anomalous effect? It pondered this as it continued to perform its rather convincing impression of a catapult. The archers had completely taken cover at this point, afraid to retaliate for fear of getting a rock to the face. Not long after, the same trumpet noise could be heard again, and the area around the towers became a lot less active. It did take SCP-682 a moment or two to realize that the entities had all disappeared with the sound of that instrument. Cowards would be cowards after all. The reptile was aching for more of a fight, but at the very least, Level 10 was offering something new. Though not all of it was new. A smiler peeked out at SCP-682 from between stalks of wheat, and this time, the reptile simply chose to ignore the uncanny grinning bastard and move on. No sense giving it the satisfaction, right? SCP-682 followed the dirt path for about a day, during which time it also encountered a pack of hounds, a skin stealer, and who could say how many death rats that scampered amidst the field. After this it came to what appeared to be some kind of settlement. The buildings here looked much more modern than the towers, and unlike the empty suburbs of level 9, the reptile could see that there were actual humans living here. From all appearances, this appeared to be a small town square with an open-air trading post, much like a farmer's market. In addition to wheat, the humans living in this settlement had all sorts of goods on display and could be seen actively bartering with each other. SCP-682 licked its lips. None of these helpless fools knew it was coming. Malt Town, as it was known to wanderers in the back rooms, was about to receive a rude awakening at the hands of a Keter-class SCP. While the archers that had been encountered earlier posed a definite threat to those straying too close to their towers, the entity seemed to conveniently ignore this humble little town. Of course, Mercy was not in SCP-682's playbook, except when it came to Jerry apparently. But the macaw was gone now, and it was time for Carnage. This was going to be fun. Welcome back to the show. We once again join SCP-682 and its trusty macaw sidekick Jerry deep in the depths of the liminal abyss known as the Backrooms. The hard-to-destroy reptile had been seemingly contained within the Backrooms for such a lengthy period of time that it was likely even the SCP Foundation had given up on searching for it. After unintentionally no-clipping out of reality, 682 was apparently doomed to wander these endless labyrinthian realities until the end of its miserable existence. The latest level it had arrived in appeared to take the form of a vast desert stretching from horizon to horizon. Sandstorms buffeted the creature, and powerful gusts of wind forced Jerry to take refuge, clinging tightly to its much larger friend's back. This was level 16, but there was far more to it than first met the eye. 
As the lizard and bird made their way across the titanic dunes, strange lights began to circle in the air above. These were entities known as light guides, singularities of pale light that bore a strong resemblance to Will-o'-the-Wisp, ghostly fire elementals out of folklore. Much like the mysterious wisps of legend, light guides appear to travelers in the back rooms whenever there is an impending danger. You'd think with all the malicious entities and bizarre hazards that SCP-682 had encountered in the previous levels, it would have seen a lot more of these. But considering how dangerous 682 itself was, the light guides probably had their non-existent hands full keeping other travelers away from it. Either way, their numbers and proximity meant that whatever was about to happen was going to be something perilous. Jerry squawked and nibbled at SCP-682 with his beak, trying to warn the reptile of the danger. 682 had no idea what to expect, but made sure to have its guard up and keep its avian companion close. The creature's instincts were sharp as ever, and the second that the level began to rearrange itself, 682 was already taking evasive action. The sand hardened and turned to stone as great pyroclastic flows began to erupt from what were once the dunes. 682 leaped across a deep fissure just as it opened up beneath the lizard's feet, narrowly avoiding a several hundred foot drop into a lake of lava. Ash rained from the sky as all traces of the desert were completely overwritten into this new volcanic landscape. This was the defining supernatural feature of Level 16, an environment that randomly reshaped itself into different geographical climates and terrains. Now that it had seen the level change completely once, SCP-682 was already over the concept. Rather than stick around and take a bath in the lava, SCP-682 decided to follow the light guides towards what appeared to be a portal made out of concentrated blue light. It passed through the portal and found itself in a cramped hallway resembling those aboard a nautical vessel, out with level 16 and in with level 17, otherwise known as the Naval Aircraft Carrier. Though there was no actual deck of the proverbial carrier, nor any potential aircrafts in the back rooms for it to transport, there didn't seem to be much happening on level 17, at least in comparison to the drastic terrain shifting of level 16. There were also absolutely no entities to be seen, as far as 682 could tell. Of course, level 17 was vexing to the reptile in a different way. The corridor it found itself in was such an extremely tight fit, moving freely was next to impossible. The back rooms was once again telegraphing the fact that it was made with humans and not overgrown lizards in mind. Waste of effort. 682 thought to itself, not even the most disgusting human had enough dumb luck to make it this far. After a few minutes of struggle, 682 shrunk down to a more manageable size so it could traverse the hallways. It was now roughly the size of a male hyacinth macaw, that is to say, jerry-sized, and it crawled through the narrow corridors of level 17 with room to spare. There was still no sign of hostile entities, and given the propensity for clumps to come avalanching out of the woodwork on previous levels, 682 saw this as a mercy. It was also grateful to no longer be exposed to the elements on level 16. SCP-682 passed the time exploring the seemingly empty corridors by having one-sided small talk with Jerry. The macaw couldn't do much more than chirp and squawk back, and before too long, 682 realized that it had very little to talk about. Its main interests were slaughtering living things and reaching containment, and both of these topics were irreverent to the current mood. A wave of embarrassment washed over the creature, as for the first time it had genuine concern that a social interaction could go poorly. It didn't want to frighten Jerry away, or come across as awkward. It was just that conversation with like-minded anomalies had been far easier at the Foundation, since the shared experience of being contained was always a good starting point. The reptile also had fond memories of the time it got to chat with SCP-079, an old AI that the Foundation secured around the same time as itself. Though it was an unusual feeling for a creature so filled with contempt and hatred, SCP-682 had started to realize that it wanted to build the same kind of rapport with Jerry. Maybe getting lost in the back rooms was exactly the kind of life experience it needed to become more approachable to the few beings it could respect. That being said, the current level it was on was rather underwhelming as a way of making memories. Just then, SCP-682 saw what appeared to be an ordinary human up ahead, 
It had its back turned to the reptile and Jerry, and seemed to be unaware of their presence. A sitting duck. Oh, good. A distraction, thought the flustered lizard. I was totally sounding like I had no life. SCP-682 charged toward the human as fast as its shrunken body could carry it. Jerry followed suit, flapping his wings and flying alongside 682. As the duo approached, the human began to turn around. What 682 anticipated was a look of abject horror on the human's face, but instead the entity simply stared through 682 as if the reptile wasn't even there. 682 was confused, but even stranger was the fact that its consciousness was starting to fade. 682 blinked, and in what felt like a second later, it awoke at full size, half-wedged in an aircraft carrier doorway. Jerry was squawking up a storm, and that was presumably what had woken 682 back up. It also seemed that making eye contact with that humanoid entity had somehow caused 682 to faint temporarily. The entity itself was long gone, much to 682's chagrin. This phenomenon was easy enough for any expert in Backroom's lore to explain, as Level 17 was home to unique entities known as imprints, which resembled humans but had the supernatural ability to induce brain death in anything that looked them in the eyes. Even so, this was an unacceptable outcome to SCP-682. Had the entities been growing stronger as the level number went higher, or was the reptile simply losing its mental fortitude? Maybe all the strange properties of this place were compounding on the creature and slowly making it go soft. 682 shrunk down again and shook off the shame of its encounter with the imprint. The only way to prove that it was better than the back rooms was by advancing through all the levels and taking down whatever entity stood in its way. This would probably mean facing at least one more pompous jerk with a spear, like Tiny and Argos before. And 682 relished the chance to triumph in another bout of single combat. Besides, if another fair fight like those were to take place, 682 would be able to show off how strong it was to Jerry. That alone was reason enough to find the entrance to the next level. The time for brooding was over. It was now time for action and adventure. Even if it took 100 years, 682 would not rest until it made it through every level of the back rooms and left the entire hellish dimension devoid of the life it so despised. It wandered the hallways of level 17 until it found a door that was discolored compared to the other ones almost as if there was a photo-negative spotlight shining on it from the other side. It was about to pass through when the same imprint it had encountered earlier stepped into the hallway. Fool me once, 682 growled, and confidently initiated a staring contest with the creature. That feeling of losing consciousness was felt immediately, but this time 682 suppressed it through sheer will. With all of its vast brain power, it fought to stay awake, and even began to concentrate the distressing emotions into its gaze. The imprint stood and continued to look at 682, but within mere moments, the entity was frothing at the mouth and falling backwards against the wall, as the effects of its own stare were reflected back at it through a mirror. 682 may have been caught off guard the first time, but its signature adaptation abilities meant that there was never a second time. Exit stage right. The reptile opened the door to the next level and moved on to level 18, which was known as the Level of Memories. Level 18 was said to take on a subjective appearance that was different to every individual wanderer, but would usually resemble a place from childhood. This was no different for 682, and the hard-to-destroy reptile was shocked to find itself in the very same primeval forest where it and its countless siblings first went to war against ancient humankind. There were even corpses littered around like in the futuristic hallways of level 15, only these dead creatures were far more familiar to the reptile. The vast majority were human warriors in Bronze Age armor, still gripping antiquated weapons such as swords and axes. Among these fallen humans were the occasional dead giant beasts, though these bodies were rather few in number, as casualties on the SCP-682 side of this war had been almost non-existent. 682 had never thought it would see this place, or those of its kind that were too weak to survive the battlefield again. It was a strange and uncomfortable feeling, not helped by the raspy whispering voices that seemed to linger in the wind of level 18. Your father will never look for you, for he has already transcended that momentary flash of anger that brought you and the rest of your litter into being. 
He only has further use for your mother, his bride. She is worth a million of you, no matter how many battles you fought in the name of his hate. Despite the ghoulish intensity of the whispering voices, the words they said were clear and direct, impossible to mistake. But the part that really caused SCP-682's blood to boil was the fact that these voices seemed to know more about its past than even the Foundation did. Tell me, disgraced Prince of Wrath, what hurts more? The fact that you proved weak enough to fall into the clutches of your greatest enemies, or the fact that those same lab coats and soldiers were the first ones that allowed you an identity of your own? distinct from the whims of your pathetic father. Lost in the wicked siren song of Level 18's voices, 682 suddenly noticed that Jerry had flown off again, or perhaps he had never entered Level 18 with the reptile at all. It called out for the macaw, but there was no answer. 682 found all of this to be very distressing, especially since these whispers seemed to come from some powerful unseen force that knew exactly what the reptile viewed as its greatest failures. It was different from the influx of negative thoughts that Level 14 caused, since that had been a product of 682's own mind. What was happening here on Level 18 was different, a separate malevolent consciousness. Perhaps the creator of the backrooms itself was completely aware of all of 682's childhood trauma, and was deliberately using it against the creature. Physical threats were one thing that 682 had always been able to overcome, but a psychological attack of this degree was beyond the capabilities of even the Foundation. Still, there had to be a way out of Level 18, or at least a way back to Jerry. Either would have given 682 a bit of breathing room from the influence of the Whispers. Fortunately, things weren't quite as dire as they seemed, as SCP-682 was about to be reminded that not all the entities in the backrooms meant to do harm. Enter Entity 198, nicknamed the Plush Dino by the explorer who first discovered it. While Level 18 is not the only level of the backrooms it can appear on, the Plush Dino often patrols the reality of childhood memories in search of wanderers in distress, and in the compromised psychological state it was in right now, SCP-682 surprisingly fit that description, thus prompting Entity-198 to come to its aid. At first, SCP-682 didn't know what to make of this peculiar, synthetic-looking entity. It approached with no ill will and wordlessly attempted to comfort the reptile through gentle contact. SCP-682 swiped at the creature with its claw. As always, it was not in the mood for cuddling with a stuffed toy. Entity 198 seemed to be able to dodge the reptile's attacks easily, and continued to do so as 682 made repeated attempts to destroy it. Nothing connected, and the plush dino circled the hard-to-destroy reptile without a scratch. What do you want from me, you worthless little creep? 682 screamed at the dino, at which point the entity turned and started to speed away in a random direction. 682 gave chase, pursuing Entity 198 through its own childhood memories towards what appeared to be the door that had led it into Level 18 to begin with. The plush dino opened the door and proceeded to walk the dinosaur into the door. Without even considering whether doing so would send itself back to Level 17, SCP-682 followed the plush dino and instead found itself in the back room's Level 19, the attic. Turns out that being blinded by anger always helps one get further in life. That's a positive lesson with no unfortunate implications. Jerry had already arrived in level 19 prior to 682, so chasing the plush dino was even more of a smart decision than the reptile could have imagined. Jerry! 682 said, running up to the macaw and wagging its tail. Jerry fluttered down from the attic rafters and landed on 682's snout. 682, ahoy! He squawked having remembered 682's designation number. Apparently, he had been paying attention to the conversations earlier. This means that 682 had confirmation that it hadn't totally screwed up this new friendship yet. On top of that, it was nice to know that Jerry had no intention of abandoning the reptile. This was certainly a warm and touching reunion, though the continued presence of the smugly grinning plush dino almost ruined it. 682 snapped its head towards the offending entity and barked an insult at it, hoping that it would get the message and leave. But Entity 198 did no such thing, 
preferring to silently watch the wholesome interaction between 682 and Jerry from a safe distance. Whatever, 682 thought. It wasn't going to waste any more time on the impish little stuffed animal. That's when Jerry swooped down and landed next to the plush dino. 198, Jerry squawked. He then waddled across the wooden attic floorboards in between 682 and 198 and squawked again. It was as if he was trying to introduce the two, and this mortified 682. Was this thing a friend of Jerry's? And if so, did that mean he was going to have to coexist with it? At the very least, the plush dino didn't seem to be alive in the conventional sense. But whether that meant it was an animated object or some kind of machine remained as vague and mysterious as most things in the back rooms. Even though it didn't technically fall into the very broad category of living organism that 682 wanted to wipe out, that didn't automatically disqualify the miniature monster as being disgusting. Especially if the dinosaur was getting overly friendly with Jerry. The blue hyacinth macaw belonged to 682 and it didn't feel like sharing especially not with some clingy toy. After the awkward introductions were over, 682 and its two tag-along companions had a look at level 19. It definitely resembled the attic of a household, complete with dusty discarded furniture and several boxes of photo albums and other mementos. There was also the orange glow and unusual fiery light that emanated from beneath the floorboards. SCP-682 didn't know why, but the glow reminded it of the same memories that it just had to relive on the previous level. This time, though, 682 was drawn to thinking about the more positive aspects of its proverbial childhood, if one could call crushing human skulls beneath its claws and facing down entire armies of humans to be positives. The truth was that SCP-682 was being mildly affected by the orange glow of level 19, which had the mimetic ability to insinuate its way into the former memories of anyone who wandered through the level. But 682 had spent enough time having its childhood ruined today, and decided to search for the exit. After all, if there were no entities present on this floor, it would be a waste of time to stick around and play into the hands of whatever was making that orange glow. Thankfully, it seemed that the Entity 198 was already one step ahead of 682 in the hunt for an exit. The plush dino had located a severely damaged wooden door with the number 20 painted in orange on its surface. No doubt this was the entrance to the next level. SCP-682 was still very annoyed that the plush dino had insisted on hanging around, but if it was going to actually be useful, the reptile would be sure to make the most of it. 682, Jerry, and the dino entered the broken doorway and found themselves inside of a wide open warehouse room. There were several corridors leading out of the room that appeared to be filled with crates on wooden and plastic pallets. This was level 20, the warehouse. Although it resembled many earlier floors of the back rooms, it was surprisingly finite. Both the corridors and the room were not of an unusual size compared to their equivalents in the real world, and according to explorers, the warehouse itself was only about 300 kilometers wide at the most. Those stats weren't especially impressive if you asked SCP-682. Whatever happened to the infinite labyrinths of liminal spaces? SCP-682 wondered. Ever since the city level, it's been nothing but confined spaces, weird mind-screw ones, and that landscape that kept changing for no reason. What happened to the classic back rooms? SCP-682 quickly came to its senses and realized what it was thinking. Classic back rooms? It sounded like one of those snobby Foundation researchers deciding what was a genuine SCP and what wasn't, based on some incredibly arbitrary standard. Besides, there were no levels of the back rooms that were remotely acceptable for 682, other than maybe level 9, and breaking them down into further categories went against the reptile's ultimate goal of destroying this horrendous place and everything associated with it. It wouldn't become like the foundation it hated by being specific and thorough. Broad sweeping statements were more SCP-682 style, and when it came to the back rooms, every level was equally disgusting. 682 turned to its companions and growled with what seemed to be excitement. Jerry, let's get moving. You too, piece of garbage dinosaur. As a creature that had spent so much of its existence in captivity surrounded by beings it deemed disgusting, SCP-682 was not used to having seemingly unlimited freedom to explore, and was even less used to having tolerable company. And yet, here the hard to destroy reptile was entering into level 21 of the back rooms, with not one, 
but two accidental companions. The back rooms were bad enough when faced alone, and the addition of annoying hangers-on only made the whole experience that much more unbearable for 682. Even the fact that SCP-682 was free of the Foundation was little consolation when being contained in the back rooms was proving to be a far more terrible fate than a lifetime spent in a vat of acid. The first and most important was that the infinitely lovable and perfectly blue Hyacinth Macaw Jerry, who SCP-682 had known for only 12 levels of the back rooms, but would undoubtedly kill everything in sight if anything happened to him. Of course, the lizard tended to want to do that anyway, but the sentiment was strong nonetheless. 682 felt the complete opposite way about the plush dino, backrooms entity 198, that had been tagging along ever since level 18. There was something about its dumb little smiling face that filled 682 with a boiling rage. Not to mention the fact that having the animated toy around would mean that Jerry's much desired attention would be split between it and 682. Three was most certainly a crowd. And if the tiny-legged scamp wasn't so proficient at dodging 682's unprovoked claw strikes and tail slaps, the hard-to-destroy reptile would have cut the plush dino out of the equation. But 682 would need to conserve some energy for the entities that lurked in the back room's level 21, a series of four hallways. Yes, you heard that right. There were only four hallways in level 21. Not infinite hallways, not a labyrinth of hallways, not even the same four hallways repeated in an endless loop. Four hallways. That's it. As a consequence of the much smaller scale of level 21, the roving bands of entities that normally are spread out across a much larger dimension find themselves clustered together in the cramped linear span of the four hallways. Even a medium entity count can be impossibly dangerous when an explorer is faced with the iconic backrooms monsters at once. Well, unless those entities are up against SCP-682. Go on, make my day, it roared. The approaching regiment of death moths, death rats, facelings, hounds, bursters, smilers, clumps, and even some completely unknown weirdos marched like soldiers. Specifically, the Gorgonites from the 1998 action comedy movie Small Soldiers, because these things were equally messed up looking and equally known for fighting losing battles. However, as CP-682 charged into the horde, it noticed that this time, the entities were a bit more tactical in the way they approached combat. Was this also a unique property of level 21? Or was the backrooms taking a page out of 682's book and adapting to new threats? The clumps vaulted with their many hands and rolled along the walls to get behind 682, while the hounds and facelings made a frontal assault. The smilers soon joined the clumps on the other side, using their uncanny ability to shift through the shadows. The death rats gnawed at 682 from underneath, attacking the reptile's footing and doing everything they could to distract it. All the while, the death moths and bursters acted as artillery, shooting acidic slime from a safe distance behind the other entities, or in the case of the death moths from above, just out of 682's reach. SCP-682 almost had to applaud the pathetic entities for getting their act together. It was facing a mobile task force made up of rejected Dungeons & Dragons monsters. A valiant effort, but doomed to end in their defeat. These entities were not the Foundation, and SCP-682 refused to lose to a bunch of aberrations cosplaying as a containment squad. It was time to give them a taste of their own medicine. And during the attacks of many entities at once, SCP-682 became a chimera of monstrous features, stolen from various backrooms entities. The freakish grin of a smiler spread across its face, while the grasping arms of a clump emerged from its back along with an impressive pair of death moth wings. The ever-disgusting acid-shooting pustules of a burster appeared across 682's body, pointing in every direction like the cannons on a naval ship. Now fully optimized to take down the organized entities with their own weapons, SCP-682 roared out a battle cry. Death to the back rooms. All burster pods ruptured at once, forcing the entities to take evasive action. Most did not get far thanks to 682's countless clump arms which grappled and held onto everything within reach. As 682 pulled the entities in towards its teeth and claws, the shredding began. 
Their numbers were thin quickly, and the once organized legion fell in disarray, with entities indecisively making desperate attacks or tactical retreats. Now the resemblance between this skirmish with the entities on level 21 and the ones that SCP-682 had with mobile task forces back at the Foundation containment facility was nearly perfect. Except this time, no force, military or otherwise, would come along to put 682 back into confinement. Now this was freedom. Did you see that, Jerry? That was classic 682. I still got it. The reptile boasted. Ah, classic. Ah. Jerry replied. In the excitement of victory, SCP-682 almost forgot that Entity-198 was still here, watching the aftermath of the carnage with the same smile it always wore. Nevertheless, 682 felt rather strongly that the plush dino was judging it. Nobody asked you, plush dino, it grumbled. On some level, the plush dino was most likely aware of SCP-682's overwhelming animosity, but it was also a simple entity driven by appropriately simplistic desires. It had its own reasons for staying by the reptile's side. In its usual role on level 18, the plush dino would seek out explorers lost in their own traumatic memories and guide them towards safety, whatever safety meant in the back rooms. The adorable entity had an inherent biological or supernatural radar sense that allowed it to detect individuals experiencing distress and suffering. Since the majority of Backroom's explorers are human, the margin of distress that the plush dino could detect and respond to was kept within the relative limits of normalcy. For this reason, the plush dino had never encountered any being that carried more feelings of distress than 682. The hard-to-destroy reptile was, from Entity 198's perspective, the most mentally pained creature in existence. The plush dino's top priority was now to be a beacon of hope for what it saw as a victim of the ultimate forms of unaddressed trauma. Of course, it was a nonverbal entity and possessed no telepathic or empathetic abilities, so conveying its more wholesome therapeutic intentions to SCP-682 was next to impossible especially since a being as aggressive and hateful as 682 would be wholly unreceptive to the notion of hugging away its problems. But this would not stop Entity 198 from making the rehabilitation of its now Keter-class charge the meaning of its oddly specific existence, even if that meant leaving potentially thousands of tortured human explorers eternally lost in level 18. The plush dino was now embodying the I-can-fix-him mentality to its logical extreme. After trying several doors throughout level 21, it was clear that the majority of them simply led back into other parts of level 21's four hallways, much like the doors in a chase scene from a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. Eventually, 682 and his party members stumbled upon a dimensional tear in the side of one of the hallways. This looked like the entrance to the next level, so 682 decided to throw caution to the wind and step through into level 22, the car park, which, unlike some of the previous levels, was in fact infinite, for whatever that was worth. A few damaged 50s-era automobiles occupied the parking spots, their metal rusted and torn to shreds. More curiously, there was what appeared to be a circus tent wedged between some of the concrete supports. There were no entities around the main area of level 21, so SCP-682 entered the tent, thinking that it was perhaps another exit. For once it seemed that the backrooms weren't subverting the reptile's expectations, as inside the tent was none other than the inside of a tent. Rows of plastic folded chairs sat within, facing a wooden podium on an elevated stage. This tent was made to hold many humans, but strangely, there was only one. An old man in ragged hiking gear that stood amongst the chairs, scribbling notes into a journal of sorts. He wore an enormous backpack that swelled with supplies and unusual bottled items. Though the fallen nation of Amstable lived inside of tents like this one, the old man muttered to himself. He then looked over his shoulder and noticed SCP-682 glaring at him. He closed his journal and stared back with an inquisitive look on his face. Oh, a new entity. I don't get to see that every day, the human laughed. Though why is it with Entity 7 and Entity 198? If those numbers are so important to you, 
Mine is 682. SCP-682 growled. Entity 682? Asked the old man, scratching his white beard. How have I never heard of you? I am not an entity. SCP-682 snapped back. I'm an anomaly. The old man shrugged and said, I fail to see the distinction. That makes two of us, 682 thought. Anyway, anomaly, 682, I'd advise against attacking me. I'm rather busy collecting notes for the Kalag Institute, and I can be a force of nature when I'm interrupted. I've dealt with bigger and scarier things than you, so wander off and leave me to my work. The old man had far too much confidence for 682's liking. Who did this human think he was, anyway? It was not going to be talked down to like that, especially not by someone from any kind of institute. It was go time. Without another word, the reptile began plowing through the chairs towards the elderly human who, in a display of agility unexpected for someone his age, gracefully hopped across the chairs to the stage, successfully evading 682's charge. Well, I did warn you. The old man reached into his pack and produced a small dark object carved of lapis lazuli stone. It resembled a scarab, or dung beetle, and there were hieroglyphics across the base of it. The old man chanted a prayer to the stone, invoking the name of the Egyptian god Kepri and causing the scarab's wings to extend. A great blue light was emitted from the lapis stone, and a terrible droning buzz hit 682 all at once, stunning it for a moment. The old man left the wing beetle hovering in the air and proceeded to draw two more unusual objects from his knapsack. In one hand, he held a bottle of fine red powder, while in the other held a bottle that appeared to contain electrical energy. He hurled both at SCP-682 and ducked for cover behind the stage. Upon impact, the bottles created a large explosion of electrical flames, which immediately caused the entire tent to go up. The old man drew a large knife and cut his way out of the tent, leaving 682 behind to burn as the structure collapsed. The human made a break for the nearest concrete ramp leading down to the lower areas of the parking garage. He looked back to see a heavily scorched 682 in hot pursuit, but no signs of Entity 7 Jerry and Entity 198 the plush dino. The Entity, no, the Anomaly, was more durable than the old man expected, and far more willing to endure pain if it meant chasing down prey. In a desperate bid to keep the monster from catching him, the old man retrieved a crystal and metal artifact from his inventory. It was known as a pocket, and true to its name, it contained a pocket dimension which could store large objects and release them at the command of its user. Earlier in his trip through level 22, the old man had stored a couple of damaged cars in the pocket in case he needed to cover from an attacking entity. As 682 gained on him, he summoned the cars back from the pocket, causing them to land in the reptile's path. While ineffective at stopping the creature, it gave the old man enough time to take a sharp turn around a corner and find a hiding spot amongst the other tents and broken down cars. The seasoned explorer had one last trick up his sleeve, and he prayed that it would bring an end to this terrifying encounter. As SCP-682 sniffed the air, searching for him, the old man produced another bottle of unbridled energy, this time derived from the same kind of dimensional rift found on level 21. He hurled it towards the reptile not a moment too soon, and watched in awe as the bottle exploded. The floor and ceilings began to crumble as arcs of energy surrounded 682. What is this? SCP-682 thought, feeling itself being pulled from this reality and into another. Seconds later, the reptile was gone in a flash of energy. The old man wiped his brow in relief. That was close. Wherever 682 was after being warped by the dimensional terror, this particular explorer had managed to escape its wrath for now. But would others be so lucky? SCP-682 found itself hurtling through an unstable dimensional rift and into some fresh new hell. 682 rose from the dirt and mulch beneath its body and found itself on level 23 of the back rooms, which had the distinguishing characteristics of being a spherical planetoid formed from the interlocking of countless towering trees. It was commonly known as the Petrified Garden, and it was the first of many backrooms levels that took the form of a globe rather than an infinite maze. I know that it is hard to imagine a spherical world, because in our native reality, the planet Earth is a flat plane with ice walls on the side. <laughs> Just kidding. 
The Flat Earth model is an inaccurate and roundly discredited conception of cosmography without any empirical evidence to support it. Could you imagine if we were peddling this kind of conspiratorial fiction here in a YouTube video? Anyway, back to our regularly scheduled program about an indestructible lizard traveling through another dimension. That's real. Nearly all of the tree specimens present on level 23 had equivalent species that were native to the front rooms, aka our reality. There were birch trees, cedars, redwoods, white oaks, and many more common types intertwined with trees that were either long extinct or never before seen on Earth. To 682, a tree was a tree. But then again, the Keter class SCP wasn't known for having a deep and abiding respect for nature. Right now, what was flashing through its reptilian head was a need to inflict violence. Preferably on the old wanderer that warped SCP-682 to level 23, but really any entity that crossed its path was liable to get a taste of the old maw and claw. Thankfully, the backrooms had a habit of deploying wave after wave of bizarre creatures from who knows where. Not more than a couple of levels ago, 682 had been faced with a veritable army of these backrooms entities and came out of the fight victorious. By this point, the hard-to-destroy reptile was well acquainted with death rats, death moths, clumps, smilers, and hounds, all of which were no doubt lurking somewhere in the woodwork of level 23. You can't run, you can hide, but I will find you and destroy you. 682 was on the hunt once again, walking through the entangled mess of trees like an unstoppable engine of rage. It had certainly been some time since 682 had encountered an entirely new entity, though it wasn't exactly clamoring for a new lore expansion. Since 682 was a being that despised all forms of life and wanted to destroy it, the reptile had the outlook of, the less entities that were present throughout the back rooms, the better. So when the Volpe appeared before 682, the anomalous monster was less than thrilled. But I'll bet that you viewers at home are excited to get to know a brand new backrooms entity after such a long wait. So why don't we give you the Carfax? Um, Car... Fox? Foxfax? We're going to tell you about the Volpe now, which no matter how it appears to the untrained eye is not, in fact, a fox. The Volpe's entity number is 119, and its name comes from the Corsican word for fox. But I must once again clarify, this entity is not actually a fox. The easiest ways to distinguish a vulpe from its more well-known counterpart in the front rooms are the abnormally elongated snout and the secondary tail. Vulpes have been known to dwell almost exclusively in levels of the back rooms that display forest-like characteristics, which one could imagine would be very few of them, but genuinely who knows at this point. There could be an infinite number of infinite forests infinitely scattered across infinite layers of the back rooms, and if that were to be the case, there would be an infinite number of vulpes in all of them. An entity 119 in its natural habitat will dwell within a subterranean den, where the vulpe digs itself in order to provide shelter and protect itself from low temperatures. These dens can be unusually elaborate and may comprise multiple branching tunnels and security measures, such as a collection of twigs that can alert the vulpe to intruders when they are disturbed. This complexity is somewhat warranted, because the Volpe stores a plentiful stash of food deep within the den, making it very unlikely for them to go hungry. These Volpes are rather clever, aren't they? Perhaps they are, but not quite clever enough to avoid being effortlessly crushed by SCP-682, as it brought its two front claws down on top of the entity. Better luck next time, Entity-119. Not that there will be a next time. SCP-682 continued to move along the surface of the planetoid, and eventually entered into a cavern created by the intertwining roots. Delving beneath level 23's forested crust, the reptile found itself inside of a glow room, an underground chamber lit by the bioluminescence of glowworm-like entities, which had been given the name Gardener's Saris. As their name would imply, these creatures constantly made noises that sounded vaguely like the word sorry. These pitiful worms crawled around the glowing fungi and smaller flora, making their signature noises, and SCP-682 was absolutely not sorry to messlessly devour every one of the gardener's saris. The room was much darker with the absence of the gardener's saris, but only temporarily so, as SCP-682 was able to take on the bioluminescent glow of its own and light its way deeper beneath the surface of level 23. 
It soon entered an area of ancient ruins that seemed man-made, yet overgrown with moss and long abandoned. SCP-682 had seen sparing evidence throughout the back rooms of abandoned human civilizations, but the ruins of Level 23 were closer in appearance to the structures built by the people of 682's native reality. They were similar to some of the great wonders of the world, but with fundamental differences. For example, a number of near replicas of the Pyramids of Giza deviated in shape enough from the originals to be arranged in a spherical formation. The other buildings found within this area of Level 23 had obvious counterparts, but none of the architecture represented modern design trends. The most advanced buildings were equivalent to buildings in the front rooms constructed in and before 1000 AD. In and among the ancient ruins could be found a large variety of artifacts, all of which seemed equally to be shoddy knockoffs of relics from the front rooms. SCP-682 stepped across the fragile pottery and clay idols, quietly satisfied at the sight of many telltale signs of civilizational collapse and the utter lack of living humans. There were a few clumps fiddling around in the rubble, but 682 didn't let them get away with existing in its presence. You dreadful rejects can return, but not Jerry. How disgusting. I miss Jerry. SCP-682's thoughts turned to its lost companion, Entity 7. The blue hyacinth macaw had been the only tolerable presence that 682 had known within the back rooms, and sadly in the hard-to-destroy reptile's entire existence. This hateful and terrific being had never understood the meaning of love and compassion until Jerry had appeared to it. It was possible that they would never meet again, and this somber realization weighed heavily on 682's mind. The big lizard continued through the glow room and noticed an unusual plaque scrawled in rough Latin. While 682 was not an avid reader, its adaptive capabilities allowed it to translate the message that was left behind by whatever beings previously inhabited level 23. It read, We dedicate this great sphere of Giza to the great gardener in hopes of forgiveness for the great wrong we have committed. Already our purple eyes have turned green. We have started to return to the earth, forgotten and overgrown. Our only hope is that alone and petrified we will not disappear as architects of a failed project. The first sentence was apparently a clear reference to the spherical Great Pyramid that 682 had come across earlier, but the significance of the rest remained a mystery. Whoever these failed architects were, there was no trace of them left on this planetoid. 682 didn't mourn them, of course, and it felt almost content to know that whatever grand project they had in store had crumbled, leaving their ruins occupied by the likes of clumps. It served them right for existing, for attempting to create something. Their sadness was proof enough that they'd learned their lesson and had long since faded into the ether. Maybe that's all the backrooms was in the end. A series of failed attempts at building worlds that would ultimately be forgotten when time and people moved on to bigger and better projects. SCP-682 mused on these thoughts as it proceeded down into the very core of Level 23. To its surprise, a sight of remarkable beauty awaited the reptile within. Their countless roots found and embraced each other surrounding the gravity-locked orb of luminescent water, an apparent source of light, nutrients, and ultimately life for the greenery of Level 23. This was the heart of the level, and it was fittingly known as the Heart of Water. 682 stared for a long time at the Heart of Water, and it wasn't really sure why. Naturally occurring wonders like this held little appeal to the reptile, but somehow this one was different. Perhaps it was because at this moment, SCP-682 truly realized how far it had come from its containment cell at Site-19. It had endured every hardship the backrooms had thrown its way, and now it was looking upon the Heart of Water, an object that it could never have fathomed existing and could never have reached until it truly became free and uninhibited, no longer subject to the whims of the Foundation. Then, the most unusual thing happened to SCP-682, a function of its physiology that was so rarely seen or utilized. SCP-682 shed a single tear. It flowed down the reptilian creature's snout, and then arrested by the gravitational pull of the heart of water, floated away and vanished into the liquid mass. This was a private moment for 682 that not even Jerry was here to see, and yet the fall of this tear may have solidified a change in 682. 
It was a mixed feeling of independence and detachment. For most of its journey through the back rooms, SCP-682 had felt an urge to completely clear the abyss and show no mercy to every entity that existed within it. Whether it manifested as determination or spite, that urge had been the overriding feeling that had driven SCP-682 to progress through every level of the back rooms in sequential order. But these new feelings made it realize that even that would be playing into the hands of the back rooms. SCP-682 once thought that the back rooms were a cold and indifferent place, like an endless universe that arbitrarily created and destroyed all the beings that existed in it without purpose or reason. But that was not the case, and in fact it seemed more likely that the complete opposite was true. The Backrooms was imbued by its creators with so much obvious intention that it was practically a sentient being. The Backrooms was heavily invested in taking itself seriously, in revering every detail that made each level distinctive, and giving every entity and hazards a specific method of ruining the experience of all wanderers that pass through. SCP-682 could now see the Backrooms for what it actually was. A desperate, pathetic thing clawing for attention, but forever doomed to be obscure and unloved. It was even sadder than an indifferent universe, because it was a constructed universe that had no greater meaning than to be acknowledged for simply being something where nothing once was. It could even be said that the words on the plaque of the glow room in level 23 were the ultimate admission of hopelessness and that there was nothing waiting for SCP-682 or any other wanderer but the similar statements of failed architects all the way down. And that was to say nothing of all the once ambitious works within the backrooms that had been erased by happenstance. Who could even say that the numbers that correspond to backrooms levels that SCP-682 had already traversed were even the correct ones? There could potentially be one or more entirely different numerical sequences to the levels that were equally as true to the ones who labeled them as such. If the backrooms didn't want to be known, to be documented, to be expanded upon, I doubt that such rigid assignments of numbers would have been acceptable by its creators. It was in realizing all of this that 682 remembered the elderly explorer that had flung him into level 23. While it was true that things hadn't gone the reptile's way in that encounter, it was questionable who the real winner was when it was clear that the man had dedicated the best years of his life to researching and wandering the back rooms. Sure, he had mastered some neat parlor tricks with the magical items native to this reality, but to be a master of the backrooms was no better than 682 declaring itself master of the acid tank in its prior containment cell. That elderly man with the trinkets could keep his hollow victory because 682 would still be alive and kicking when that human's bones were nothing more than set dressing left behind in some heretofore untouched level of the backrooms. His fate would be the same as the rest of the backrooms eventually, a joke with no real setup and punchline forgotten. To attempt to complete or destroy or uncover the mysteries behind the backrooms was exactly what the loathsome cluster of disjointed concepts wanted, and 682 was done with giving this liminal nightmare the satisfaction. Sometimes the only way to win a game is not to play the game at all. And that was precisely how SCP-682 would approach the backrooms from here on out. Maybe it would be trapped forever, or maybe it would be sent home at any moment, but caring about the outcome either way was a waste of precious brain power. There was only one way to deal with the desperate neediness of the backrooms, and that was embracing and becoming internally the cold, indifferent universe that it could never be. And that was now what SCP-682 would be, enlightened and fully detached from this reality. It strode out of the heart of water and into another glow room, only to find an outpost of Major Explorers Group waiting for it. Let's try something new. SCP-682 easily broke down the door and found itself surrounded by panicked humans. Many of them were wielding pump-action squirt guns and had begun spraying 682 with what seemed to be almond-flavored water. 682 didn't react to these attacks at all, and slowly wandered towards the humans with no particular urgency. Pardon my intrusion, 682 said, grinning with as much politeness as it could muster. Do any of you fine people know the way back to level 9? The humans shuddered, unsure how to answer. 
They stood in their silence until one brave soul came forth and spoke to SCP-682. Uh, there's a gateway inside of this outpost that can take you to the next level, said the explorer. But it appears to be one way since whatever was on the other side appears to no longer exist. What do you mean it no longer exists? 682 asked, trying against its better judgment to make sense of the circumstances. The explorer nodded and went on, seemingly motivated by fear. We mean it's no longer part of any current archive of Backrooms-related phenomenon, and its name will likely be erased soon. Not that having the name would provide any consolation. After all, there's still no telling what is on the other side, and if it was ever what the explorers who reported on it claimed it was. Now this was an unsettling development. 682 had only just started to come to terms with the instability of reality in the Backrooms and the notion that a level could be totally wiped from existence and leave behind a gateway to absolutely nowhere was chilling even to the immortal lizard. What would happen to 682 if the reptile stepped through the gateway? Would it find itself in the place that the gateway was once and still is connected to? Or would it simply disappear into the void as if it were never there at all? Because this was the back rooms, there was always a third option too, as well as countless others that defied all logic. So now, the question facing SCP-682 was to step into the unknown or to remain here in Level 23 with the Major Explorers group. It was a difficult decision, to say the least. The humans looked on as SCP-682 carefully weighed its options. Eventually, the reptile opened its mouth to speak on the matter. I'll give it some thought, 682 said. You have been very helpful for a disgusting human. So for the time being, I will permit you to continue your meaningless existence. And I guess that includes the rest of your outpost. Uh, oh, that's, um, <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, y yeah, th thank you, the human stammered. 682 turned and began to walk towards the heart of water. It intended to take its time with its choice, since progress through the levels of the backrooms was no longer something that the reptile would be pursuing with reckless abandon. It heavily considered going back on its words and slaughtering all the members of the major explorers group in this outpost, as it had done in all the other outposts. But it was plain to see that a human trapped in the backrooms barely qualified as living, because nothing could be worse than being permanently stuck in the torturous abyss. 682 had no idea whether pure spite towards them was what made sparing their lives so compelling, or something else had motivated that decision, but regardless, the hard-to-destroy reptile did not destroy the humans of Level 23. As it exited the base, the brave human that had spoken to it called out, Wait, lizard, I have to know, what are you? 682 stopped and stared at the human. It's just, we need to catalog you. I've never seen anything else in the back rooms like you. 682 breathed out. It sounded almost like a surrender. I am Entity 682. After those words left its jaws, 682 wandered away from the human until it was once again sitting by the heart of water. It didn't think about the choice or the gateway immediately. For now, Entity 682 was peacefully reminiscing back to the quality time it had spent with Entity 7, Jerry, in this pointless and nonsensical place known as the back rooms. They would meet again. That was the one thing 682 could be sure of. Somehow, some way, they would meet again. An indeterminate amount of time later, over 24 levels away from the reptile in the front rooms, the reality which it had no clipped out of so many days and weeks ago, the researchers of the SCP Foundation had gathered together and were celebrating an unforeseen event. Almost all of them had long since given up hope that it could ever happen. And yet, here they were, standing before the O5 Council and all the illustrious scientists and soldiers that had worked to make this day a reality. Everyone watched in total amazement as the heads of the Foundation declared the Keter Class SCP-682 hard-to-destroy reptile permanently neutralized. Vines, branches, and tendrils grab at 682's wriggling body as the skinless, grinning face of the Skeleton Queen bears down. She is in total control. For one of the first times ever, 682 has encountered a threat who might be too powerful for even its strength and adaptability to surpass. How could such an impossible circumstance come to pass? Lost in an endless abyss of liminal realities, 
separated from its closest companions, and officially declared to be neutralized by the SCP Foundation. The immortal reptilian entity known as 682 continues its incomprehensible journey through the back rooms. 682 had explored over 20 different levels of the back rooms, from vast oceans to lost cities, to even mind-warping spaces that evoked distant childhood memories. Very little, if any, of what 682 had encountered could be described as fun or adventurous. In 682's mind, the back rooms was a nightmare controlled by malicious forces that only wanted to bring harm to the creature. The lizard had faced scores of violent entities, ranging from low-level fodder like clumps, smilers, and death moths, spear-wielding mini-bosses like Tiny and Argus, and one particularly crafty and well-equipped explorer. Through all of these encounters and the dimension-hopping hijinks that came with them, 682 had become enduring and resilient. The uncontrollable rage and disgust for life that had defined 682's personality during its time in containment had gradually subsided into an almost enlightened state of determination. The will to be its own master, decide its own destiny, and to travel the back rooms not as a conqueror, but as an entity seeking freedom for its sake. It spent a long time contemplating its purpose in the cryptic ruins of the Petrified Garden on level 23, before making a new effort to travel between layers of the back rooms. As one might expect, the next level that 682 was able to access was level 24, known by some as the Study, but better known by its locals as the Moon. Even as far as levels in the back rooms go, Level 24 was an unusual concept for 682 to understand at first. The walkable portion of the level appeared to be a plastic model of a moon, blown up to colossal proportions. The moon was a part of a scale model of the solar system, and was situated inside a Victorian-era study of impossible size. The exact details of the massive room were hard to see, given the anomalous blurry filter that appeared to impede the vision of those who tried to look away from the moon. Hmm. No consistent theme with the previous levels, vague and inexplicable properties, and a seemingly random resemblance to human-made structures. Hmm. Classic back rooms, 682 mused. In the distant expanse of the study, Entity 682 thought that it saw a titanic human man in a tuxedo pulling a book from one of the shelves and sitting down to read it. This blurry giant was known simply as Buford, and it was the only unique entity to this level of the back rooms. The craters and rifts of the moon were home to swarms of death moths and clumps, though there were noticeably not as many of these hostile entities as on previous levels. 682 regarded the presence of these familiar foes as something of a novelty, given the amount of time it had spent on the relatively safe level 23. The more things change, the more they stay just as disgusting. While 682 was not exactly pleased with having to share the same reality as these infernal things, it was not about to rush in and start taking names. If the researchers at the Foundation could see 682 now, they might assume that the reptile had been reformed of its violent ways. This was not the case. 682 had come to accept that these creatures had no real ecosystem or drive to propagate themselves as other life did. The mechanics of their existence seemed to be limited to the mere fact that they were extensions of the back rooms itself, obstacles placed in the path of explorers to thwart their progress. They were more like the enemies of a video game than sentient life forms, and 682 had come to believe that fighting them would be doing exactly what the back rooms wanted it to do. If 682 needed to defend itself, it would absolutely fight back against these stock entities. But by now, it was obvious that they were not a real threat. There were better games to play in the arcade of life, and 682 was not feeling particularly flush with tokens. Appropriately enough, the next level that 682 arrived at, level 25, was filled with a wide selection of arcade machines. Once again, the backrooms had thrown another devious curveball in the direction of 682. The hard-to-destroy reptile was reminded once again of just how unpredictable the variations in theme could be between levels. True to its retro aesthetic, level 25 seemed to be covered in a thin layer of dust, 
The arcade machines themselves were damaged and broken down. The few that did seem functional were not equipped with any game that 682 was familiar with. Then again, 682 was not exactly an avid gamer. Perhaps the sorry state of the arcade would be explained by the level being where the 80s went to die, or more likely, by the fact no human explorer had made it this far into the backrooms in quite some time. The lack of humans in an environment designed for them was hardly a new occurrence inside of the backrooms, and as usual, the general idea seemed to be that something that was usually normal, like a hotel or an office, was presented in a way that made it inconvenient. An arcade where no games could be played was certainly a bummer, but considering that it's several layers farther down than a level where explorers were forced to confront their traumatic pasts, and another level that threatened all explorers with ever-shifting extreme environments, the plight of being stuck in a defunct arcade was a bit of an underwhelming concept. 682 had long since accepted that there was no linear difficulty curve to the back rooms, and given that this place was also devoid of entities, level 25 didn't seem to have much to offer the reptile. With no other options, 682 decided to try one of the arcade machines. Naturally, it didn't carry any quarters on its being, but that was only a minor quibble to a creature as adaptable as 682. I can do anything. As 682 approached one of the functional arcade machines, it developed a quarter-shaped skin tag on the tip of its snout, similar to the knobby growth of a male gyarl crocodile. It extended this growth towards the coin slot on a wire-thin appendage. As if it were an actual quarter, 682 did its best impression of placing a quarter inside of an arcade machine. Once the machine blinked to life, 682 retracted its organic quarter. The bright screen of the cabinet began to shuffle rapidly through numbers like a slot machine. It did this for several minutes until landing on the number 28. Sparks of energy coursed through the arcade cabinet, and a sudden burst of light whisked 682 several levels ahead. 682 could see a tunnel of light on all sides as it flew through the liminal space between liminal spaces. It was able to perceive a hint of level 26, a seemingly ordinary apartment building, and level 27, an innocent-looking hot spring inside of a cave. Both concepts were old hat at this point, so 682 didn't feel too bad about skipping them. Besides, it was a free being now, and what was freer than breaking the rules and skipping a few levels? Unless the backrooms was hoping it would do that. But there was no time to think about the inscrutable intentions of the Abyss's creators, because 682 had reached the other side of the light tunnel and had been deposited into level 28, a dimension with a navy blue sky and a single large castle on a hill, the only landmark. 682 moved towards the castle and was greeted by the sound of great thunder above. Dark storm clouds began to fill the sky as rain poured down onto the forested valley surrounding the keep. While no ordinary storm would deter a being as powerful as 682, the howling winds and flashes of light signaled that this weather was anything but ordinary. The reptile naturally decided to continue into the only available shelter, the castle. It barged in through one of the walls in an effort to hide itself from the elements. It soon learned that it was not alone. A foreboding figure approached from the darkness of the keep, clad head to toe in colorful blue armor. Who goes there? Answer me, you scaly knave! Feeling a bit spicy, 682 decided to break out an old favorite threat. What good does it do for a lamb to know the name of its butcher? I am simply passing through. You're just one more lifeless husk dreamed up by the back rooms, so leave me be and return to your dull routine of scaring weak humans. Foul beast, the Blue Knight said. I would never scare humans on purpose. I happen to quite respect them. As a matter of fact, I have met a particularly good human who taught me so many wonderful things. You say you've met a good human? 682 asked. Other than the exception of the dead, I cannot think of any humans that are worthy of existence, let alone good. Well, then you don't know Sarah, the Blue Knight said, seemingly in a state of rising emotional distress. The storm outside began to grow in intensity in response to the Blue Knight's provoked reaction. 682 found this somewhat intriguing and decided to push the armored figure a bit further. Is she your girlfriend? 
682 taunted. 682 was becoming simultaneously more amused and disgusted by this Blue Knight as the interaction went on. It was clear that the Blue Knight was a bit of a lunatic, and definitely a soft-hearted being, though as 682 pondered his words, an odd feeling of realization washed over the reptile. Was the current situation regarding 682's lost traveling companion, Entity 7, Jerry, not dissimilar from what the knight was going through in regards to this human named Sarah. 682 had learned much about the back rooms during his time traveling with the blue hyacinth macaw and did miss the avian entity very much. The idea that Jerry may have forgotten about 682 and might be on adventures somewhere else made 682 almost feel regretful. Suddenly tormenting this overly sensitive knight didn't seem to be that much fun to 682. All at once, the reptile wanted out of this level, so he ordered the knight to give him an exit. The blue knight shook his head for a bit, but ultimately relented. He led 682 to an archway deep in the castle made of solid bones. It was a dimensional portal, like many of those seen in the back rooms, and it was carved with the number 32. This portal shall take you to the forest of the Skeleton Queen on level 32. It is a dangerous place where you will almost certainly meet your demise. The Skeleton Queen is not known for her hospitality. The force of the Skeleton Queen was about what one might expect from its name. A dark and gloomy woodland beneath a starless sky and a crescent moon. Of course, there was also the countless skeletons floating amongst the trees to give the level some personality. All of them seemed somewhat alive, but like many of the backroom's other tricks, this may have only been an illusion. It will do. Before 682 could even fully take in the scenery, he could see another entity moving between the trees. It seemed to be a human woman in a Victorian dress and skeletal face paint. She appeared to gesture to 682, beckoning the reptile into the forest. There was nothing to lose yet, so 682 took to the mysterious woman's provocation and followed her. Not too far down the path, 682 lost sight of this strange human woman. It was as if she had been there a moment and was gone the next. 682 pondered the odd nature of this encounter and decided to turn back around and follow a different path. As soon as the reptile turned, the woman appeared before it again, but this time her overall form was more sinister. She was tall and gaunt, with hardly any skin, and the white of her bones shone ominously in the moonlight. She smiled an evil smile, and without a single word, she snapped her fingers, causing the entire forest to immediately turn on 682. It was an attack more sudden and more complete than any 682 had ever experienced. There was no chance to sense her hostility, no room to adapt or to react. The trees took hold of 682, and in a display of immense supernatural power that defied all logic, tore 682's very spirit out of its physical form and dragged it into the darkness beneath the forest. In its long and miserable life, the immortal reptile 682 had endured every punishment and form of damage in creation, but here and now in the back rooms, for the very first time, 682 would not have the luxury of its hard-to-destroy infinitely adaptable body. It was now a helpless, disembodied soul without any means to defend itself, the perfect plaything for the Skeleton Queen herself. Forged by the darkest whims of powers beyond reality, SCP-682's body was a temple to all things feared by mortals. With extreme regenerative abilities, unparalleled adaptive power, and formidable features that surpass any non-anomalous apex predator and the vast majority of anomalous ones. And yet, on level 32 of the back rooms, 682 has now been separated from its indestructible body by a possibly even stronger being. The powerful back rooms entity known as Skeleton Queen, who rules levels 32 with a bony fist, has exerted the power of her domain and has disembodied the soul of 682, rendering the malicious reptile, or rather its spirit, completely helpless. Nobody would be coming to save 682's soul from its current predicament. Of course, 682 was not the kind to rely on others, 
and was more surprised by the fact that it had a mortal soul. The closest thing to an all-powerful god in the front rooms, SCP-343 was recorded as being unable to even interact with 682, a fact that the reptile itself was only later made aware of because it likewise could not perceive 343. The notion of residing as a pure consciousness in either heaven or hell, should they exist, was never something 682 believed had a chance of happening. As if my existence would ever be extinguished anyway. The rules of the back rooms were mysterious and different from 682's native reality, so it was possible that the labyrinthian dimensions defined what a soul was in a different way. But there was a second option that 682 was considering, not in the forefront of its mind, but deep down in the place of vulnerability which it had become more in touch with as it traveled in the back rooms. That second option was the possibility that the sum total of 682's experiences in the back rooms had somehow imbued the creature with a soul or ignited the dormant spark of its soul, causing it to grow to full size like a spectral flame. Surely the fact that there was some essence to its current form, a self that existed outside of the confines of its monstrous physical shape, was proof enough that 682 had become, or always was, more than the sum of its creature parts. I will not be anyone's pawn to manipulate. I have a soul that belongs to myself alone. That knowledge alone kept 682 from surrendering to its fate as the Skeleton Queen's plaything. Ever since it had escaped the Foundation, its goal had been to maintain that unassailable freedom. Like the old AI that it once befriended in its native reality, 682 was now thoroughly convinced that it was not merely a machine, but instead a free will being with a right to exist outside of containment. The once undefeated beast would reclaim its record no matter what it took. It refused to turn away its future potential by becoming a permanent resident of the forest of the Skeleton Queen. The entity herself was still in her larger, more imposing form. She carried 682's soul deeper into the forest, leaving her tree warriors to devour the reptile's abandoned physical body. 682 knew better than to attempt to converse with the Skeleton Queen, as she seemed to be mute, possibly by choice. It chose instead to keep its mind active, searching for an opening to make an escape. The Queen soon found a skeleton floating amongst the branches, which, unlike most of the others, didn't have glowing eyes. With a single graceful motion of her hand, she placed the spectral fire of 682's soul inside the skull of the floating skeleton. In a flash, 682 found its consciousness inside of a new body, the skeleton itself. This wasn't an ideal form compared to what 682 was used to, but it could feel that mobility was possible in these skeleton limbs, and that was a far cry from being a disembodied spirit. This body is weak but it will have to do. Now I must bide my time for that opening." 682, the skeleton, remained almost motionless as the Skeleton Queen admired her new acquisition. A few moments later, she shrank back to her more humanoid form and danced away into the world. 682 now had the glade to itself, and it remembered well where its former body had been left. Once the Skeleton Queen was completely out of view, Skeleton 682 leaped down from its heights of the trees and landed on the ground. It took off, running towards the place where its soul had been removed, planning to assimilate itself back into its old body. I have to become myself again. Then that disgusting Skeleton Queen will regret crossing my path. As if responding to 682's thoughts of revenge, the Skeleton Queen danced back into its path. Skeleton 682 froze in place and was caught off guard as the Skeleton Queen snapped her fingers and caused several more skeletons to fall from the upper branches. All at once, the skeletons began to dance. Not knowing another way to move past in its current form, 682's soul made the skeleton body it was inhabiting begin to dance. This caused the Skeleton Queen to make the first vocalization that 682 had heard her make, a deep, feminine laugh. She extended her hands and took hold of the skeleton that housed 682's soul, leading it into a ballroom dance. 682 bitterly mumbled about this whole thing being humiliating. Ah, so he can speak. 
said the Skeleton Queen. What an interesting soul you are. 682 was not expecting the Skeleton Queen to sound so human. But considering that the rulers of other levels that 682 visited were also capable of speech, her attempts to communicate were a sign that she was not as different from the other backroom's entities as she might have seemed. For now, she wasn't in her most monstrous form, and that meant she didn't feel threatened. And in that state of blissful ignorance was exactly where 682 wanted her. 682, in this new skeleton form, protested that his soul was not of this dimension. He was a powerful being from another universe, one that should not be messed with. The Queen smiled. To her, 682's soul was no different from any of the others that she'd captured in her skeleton-filled playground. Naturally, 682 found being compared to other beings disgusting and insulting. Again, the queen was merely amused. She said, I witnessed the plight of lost godlings, fell beasts, and the brood spawn of the outer darkness and its many incarnations. This forest and my power over it are immune to the stain of scarlet. Here, there is only room for black and white. 682 chuckled in its skeleton frame. So was the skeleton queen the true ruler of the backrooms? You still don't get it. There are no backrooms. Nothing is real. The queen had started to become a bit more ominous in her tone. 682 almost missed the timber of humanity that was once there. She went on describing in details she couldn't know. Every step of the journey that brought 682 to this place. She spoke of the close bond that 682 had formed with Entity 7, Jerry, of the places of tranquility that made 682 feel something close to happiness, and of the victories against all the hostile entities that 682 had bested. She described it as a dream or a poem, a fleeting and beautiful eulogy for a soul now freed of all obligations, freed from purpose, freed from life. 682 watched as the body it hoped to return to was pulled deep beneath the surface of the forest. The Skeleton Queen continued to lead her skeletons in dance. It was a dance of surrender, of loss, of the inevitable doom of all souls. 682 was starting to forget which skeleton its soul was even inside of anymore. Anger began to course through what remained of SCP-682's consciousness. This cannot be how I meet my demise. I will not face such a disgusting fate. And then, just then, it all clicked. 682 realized that its soul wasn't inside any of the skeletons at all, because it had been lying dormant somewhere else, somewhere far more expected. The Skeleton Queen hadn't ripped out the essence of its spirit, but instead had fallen for a trick that even this piece of 682's consciousness hadn't known about. <laughs> of course, as if I could have a soul. Beneath the earth of the woods, SCP-682's reptilian body began to stir. It was now connected to the soul that dwelled within the Skeleton Queen's forest. A soul created through the heart to destroy reptiles' indomitable ability to adapt to any, and we do mean any, adverse circumstance. Its powers of adaptation went beyond the physical and into even the metaphysical. It could, for lack of a better description, forcibly evolve its very soul. While the Skeleton Queen was capable of manipulating the souls of human explorers, controlling the entirety of 682's mind was far beyond her capabilities. So in response to her supernatural curse that removes souls, 682 broke off a tiny piece of its consciousness to serve as a decoy, or more accurately, a parasite that was slowly infecting level 32 the forest of the Skeleton Queen. And now was the real opening for 682 to overcome the control of the latest backroom's entity to believe that it was up to the challenge of destroying the hard-to-destroy reptile. 682 gloated that the Skeleton Queen had never truly known what it was up against. The dance of the skeletons ceased as the Queen became aware of rumblings of 682's original body digging its way back towards the surface. I am not simply another child of the Scarlet King. I am more than my bloodline, more than whatever destiny was chosen for me. I am a greater threat than even the Foundation knew. But you'll know. The monster that was SCP-682 emerged from the ground, biting into the Skeleton Queen and immobilizing her. One skeleton stepped forth, approaching the Queen. 
then another, and soon, all of them. 682 was now in control of the Skeleton Queen's entire realm, the sole decoy having fulfilled its purpose. Skeleton Queen. 682 said through the body of a skeleton, A part of me thought you really could have been the one to bring me down. But I have to thank you, because now you have shown me the truth of the back rooms. And the truth is, anything can be the back rooms. The Skeleton Queen cried out in pain as 682's jaws sunk deeper into her. She tried to take her intimidating monster form, but even that was not enough to pry herself free from the reptile's grasp. In your memory, I will become the thing that I once hated. I will become the back rooms. As it spoke those words, 682's adaptation advanced to an entirely new level. As it had demonstrated in so many cross-tests, 682 devoured and assimilated the properties of the threat it was currently facing. In a moment of sheer willpower and freakish resilience, 682 absorbed the Skeleton Queen and her huge force of skeletons into its body. Level 32 buckled and warped under the command of a new master. Hostile entities from every level felt a terrifying disturbance in the back rooms, as one of the great level rulers was toppled. At the same time, 682's perception of the back rooms changed dramatically and rapidly. It found itself on level zero once more, clearing through entity after entity in a vengeful stampede. Then, minutes later, it was cycling through every level at incredible speed, drawing in the essence of the backrooms itself and becoming something greater than either SCP-682 or the backrooms. When the great shift in the liminal abyss subsided, 682 had taken its most powerful form yet. Its reptilian body still existed, but its soul, or at least what had become of the soul fragment it had created, had expanded into a wholly new level of the backrooms, an amalgamation of every level that 682 had ever touched. Welcome to level 682. The Hard to Destroy Reptile was now more than an entity dwelling within the sea of altered realities. It had become an irrevocable element of the backrooms. A being that would soon be feared as a master among the dimension rulers of many worlds. But it did have plenty more levels to conquer first. SCP-682 was once at the mercy of the liminal abyss known as the Backrooms, but now the Heart to Destroy Reptile had become a master of the Backrooms. After absorbing the essence of the Skeleton Queen, along with several other powerful Backrooms entities, SCP-682 had become powerful enough to create its own level of the Backrooms, Level 682. If you cannot beat the Backrooms, become the back rooms. In its latest adapted form, 682 was able to command the lesser entities of the back rooms, such as clumps, death moths, and hounds. These entities were now at the beck and call of 682, and could be deployed at moment's notice to savage trespassers on 682's level. While it was nearly unfathomable to believe that any human explorer could survive the long journey from level 0 to level 682, challengers would soon arrive to attempt to snatch the proverbial crown from 682's reptilian head. The death of the Skeleton Queen had upset the balance of the back rooms, and now there were countless other supernatural beings that wanted a taste of the scrappy newcomer. The first two warriors to arrive were the infamous spear-using humanoids Entity 74 Argos and Entity 720 Tiny. Other than a shared weapon of choice and a mutual hatred for SCP-682, these two entities had little in common, but the sting of their previous defeats at the claws of their hated rival had compelled the two to make their way to level 682 and face the lizard once more. Argos bellowed as he entered into the devastated wasteland of level 682. He had appeared first, accompanied by a specially trained retinue of human soldiers in tactical gear, the eyes of Argos. Each one wielded a lesser replica of their immortal leader's signature spear, and all were ready for battle. Faced with these intruders, all SCP-682 could do was laugh wickedly. Its own army of hostile entities stood at attention, leering at the humans. Entity 74, Argos. 
SCP-682 greeted its visitor. Even without eyes in that swollen head of yours, you must see that you cannot win this. Argos roared that 682 was a sinner, and his judgment was here. Argos pointed his spear, and the eyes of Argos charged toward 682, who in turn raised a claw and signaled its own forces to meet the eyes on the field of combat. Level 682 of the backrooms was now a battlefield. Human soldiers and entities were clashing in pinched warfare. Argos broke through the front lines and turned his spear on 682. The reptile merely grinned through all of its teeth as Argos' spear was deflected effortlessly off its hide. Argos struck again and again, but it seemed that the eyeless giant had totally underestimated 682's new form. This was not going to be the same fight as the previous time the two had met, with the level of strength that the reptile had amassed. It might not even be anything that could be considered a fight. At least, not if it remained a one-on-one -on -one battle. Fortunately for Argos, the other of the backroom's spear duo was about to make a splash, literally. A gateway to level 7, the Endless Ocean, opened above the battlefield, causing an untold quantity of water to flow into the war zone of level 682. It was chaos as both Argos and 682's minions were swept up in the current and drowned out. Argos was frustrated at the sudden loss of his army, but 682 couldn't care less about what happened to backrooms entities that had temporarily bought themselves a bit more time in existence by pledging loyalty to their reptile master. It was, after all, only a matter of time before 682 had gotten sick of them and destroyed the miserable entities on a whim. Serious contenders only. Your entrance was sinful. Argo spat towards Tiny as the rushing water submerged him. My entrance, like everything I do, was perfect, Tiny scoffed. Now are you going to aid in my revenge against this loathsome beast, or are you going to be sanctimonious as usual? The spear duo acknowledged each other, and putting aside their differences in a temporary alliance, dove for 682 in an attempt to overwhelm the hard-to-destroy reptile. The tips of both spears collided with 682, and managed to push the creature a short distance across the now-submerged landscape of its level. In retaliation, 682 traded its claws for a number of flexible tentacles that were able to push off the ground and propel the level master towards its two adversaries. It grappled Argos with its long, flexible arms and swung him against the solid surface of the ground. The eyeless warrior countered by stabbing one of 682's tentacles, but the clever reptile shed the tentacle immediately and jettisoned towards Tiny. The humanoid attempted to stab 682, but was unable to hit his target as his opponent used its tentacles to grab Tiny's body and maneuver around him effortlessly. Meanwhile, Argos was just now coming to grips with a disadvantage of its own. While on land, the Sin Hunter was quite capable of sustaining countless injuries and regenerating from the damage, its respiratory system had no way to evacuate the water that had begun to fill the humanoid's lungs. Though he was immortal, Argos was drowning. Even his unlimited stamina could not prevent his body from slowing down. At this moment, both entities were unable to gain a significant advantage over 682. Moreover, the lack of cohesion between their tactics was leaving both open to a counterattack. This was precisely the kind of opportunity that 682 had been waiting for. While in its prior state, the hard-to-destroy reptile was only able to adapt its own physique, but now that it had become one with a portion of the backrooms, it had gained the ability to adapt its level as well. In an instant, 682 asserted its control over its domain and expunged the water from level 7 back into the liminal nothingness between levels. While Argos could now stand back on solid ground, it was sluggish and immobilized by the water in its body. He attempted to gag and force the water out, but leaving that kind of opening was a time that Entity 74 didn't have. Entity 720 came crashing down upon Argos, smothering the Entity. Having now immobilized both of its adversaries, 682 was quite proud of itself. It whipped at Tiny with its fearsome tentacles, adding insult to injury with deep wounds across the giant's entire form. Spear carriers don't belong on the main stage. Drawing from the same wellspring of power that allowed it to absorb the Skeleton Queen, 
SCP-682 devoured the essence of both Entity-74 and Entity-720. Just like the time before, the heart to destroy reptile went one step further than mere consumption. The reptilian master of dimensions assimilated and incorporated elements of level 7 and level 10 into the exponentially growing borders of level 682. Now that it was victorious against the two spear-wielding humanoids, 682 let out a mighty roar that echoed throughout all the remaining levels of the back rooms. The message to all dimensional rulers on every level was crystal clear. If they didn't come to level 682 to challenge its master, the reptile would bring the challenge to each and every one of them. I am the back rooms, and when my kingdom comes, I will be all there is. While most of the entities and humans on the other levels cowered in fear, there were still several who still wished to stand and fight. The next opponent that would confront SCP-682 in an attempt to slay the creature was none other than the Blue Knight of level 28. The brightly shining suit of armor strode into level 682, carrying a raging storm behind it. Hurricane force winds beat down on 682, followed by an unforgiving rain of lightning bolts. The reptile weathered the storm and struck back, with a vicious bite that crushed the armor of the Blue Knight's arm and part of his chestplate. Then, 682 turned like a crocodile in a death roll, inflicting even more damage to the sentient armor. With his free gauntlet, the Blue Knight pounded on 682's head, bringing down even more lightning and wind on the reptile. Your storm is weak. I feel disgusting having to use my immense power to dispel it. Yet again, 682 manipulated its level of the back rooms, causing the storm that the Blue Knight had called to be banished into the void between levels. The Blue Knight was aghast. The reason he had always stayed on level 28 was to spare the humans of more settled levels from the wrathful storm clouds that he was known to create in his moments of emotional outbursts. It was his most shameful curse, and yet 682 had made it disappear as simply as morning mist. The now powerless Blue Knight could do nothing as he too was devoured by 682. His next words were a plea for a wish that could never come true. I wish I could have seen you one more time, Sarah. Like Argos and Tiny before him, the Blue Knight and his corresponding level 28 had become part of 682 now. 682 was starting to get accustomed to the feeling of devouring levels of the back rooms. The taste was invigorating, and out of a sense of malicious initiative, the reptilian entity went on an unplanned rampage through the surrounding levels. While it was nothing more than a trivial test of the incredible power at its disposal, 682 was able to drink in more of the backroom's essence, and soon it was beginning to reshape the liminal abyss itself. Countless entities were nothing more than cannon fodder to the unstoppable machine of destruction that 682 had become. As foe after foe fell prey to Entity 682, master of the back rooms, more of the other levels began to disappear as they were absorbed into level 682. The reptile was on a violent spree at this point, and could almost imagine itself back at the foundation, painting the walls with mobile task force agents and researchers alike. In its frenzy, SCP-682 found itself once again face to face with the plush dino of level 18, the despised Entity 198 who served as a guide for lost and distressed souls, and had once regarded SCP-682 as the most tormented being in existence. Even now, the plush dino's instinct to reach out to those suffering from terrible anguish had guided it to the new and improved 682. 682 had always disliked 198, and was especially resentful that it had chosen to appear now. Did its presence mean that deep inside, 682 was still suffering from the scars of its past? No, I have overcome that. Adapted. I always do. 682 stepped forward as if to consume its next victim, 
but a nagging feeling stopped it from committing to the attack. If it were to devour the plush dino, there was a possibility that it would also consume level 18, a subjective realm that would always transform to recreate the childhood traumas of the explorer inside it. 682 had not been afraid to face its traumatic past during its journey through the earliest layers of the back rooms, but to make the echo of those painful memories a permanent part of its form seemed to be a bridge too far. Besides, what would Jerry think of me? SCP-682 caught itself thinking of Entity 7 again. It was frozen with indecision, unsure whether or not to devour Entity 198 on the spot. Then, a sudden blaze of scorching flames snapped 682 back to the present moment. This gasp of inferno caused the plush dino to turn tail and move to a different level of the back rooms. 682 was now surrounded by fire at some distant level that it had never seen before. On the horizon stood a vast army of flaming beings, glowing with a solar light that gave off an unbelievable amount of heat. Presiding above all others in this militant fire army was the apparent leader, a six-armed bright red humanoid whose regal features were as imposing as the halos of sunflare that adorned his fingertips. This unfathomable being would soon be 682's latest and thus far greatest challenger. He was a legend of the backrooms and the true ruler of the warlike dimension of level 966, the Inferno, an ancient god whose relentless forest fires had chased Lord Wormwood and his tree people to the brink of extinction. The Forge Master, who pulled the flame o' the golden from the all brilliance and made it his source of power. This was Rajaharan, the Golden Kindle, Prince of Fires of Light. O oh, great beast of level 682, I, Rajaran, have heard the tales of your glorious conquest throughout the liminal spaces of these back rooms. I have heard that you hail from the front rooms and are the uncontested strongest being from that reality. I am here to answer your summons and per your request for a challenge, see which of us is the greater. The Prince of Fires moved his hands and cast forth a merciless conflagration of stellar flame. 682 was bathed in the fury of a thousand suns and felt an unthinkable rush of pain, unlike even the sword of the Guardian from back home. The fires continued to lick its form as 682 went berserk and charged towards the armies of Rajaharan. Quick as the spark of an ignited flame, Rajaharan intercepted 682 and delivered a punishing kick to the lizard's spine. Fire swirled around the prince's limbs, transforming into burning weapons. Do not think your quarrel is with my army, the prince said flatly. They are here to watch. Rajaharan swung all six of his muscular limbs, striking away at 682 with the divine weapons held in each. 682 cried out in agony, swinging a claw back at the prince and leaving a cut across the regal being's face. The reptile then stole a page from its fallen adversaries and transformed its tail into an unbreakable spear, striking Rajaharan with a swift attack. Magnificent! Rajaharan smiled. The battle raged on for several hours, with both entities taking severe damage and continuing to fight, even as their bodies were wounded with the sheer force of all the attacks given and received. As it dragged on, Rajaharan revealed even greater reserves of solaric power than 682 could have believed. Likewise, 682's strength continued to rise as the reptile acclimated to its ungodly strong opponent. Several times, 682's body was burned entirely to atomic ash, but it was able to regenerate and continue the struggle against the Prince of Fire and Light. It was much later when Rajaharan fell. The noble Golden Kindle had a smile on his face an eternal acknowledgement that the opponent he had faced was one truly worthy of killing him. Well fought, Lord of 682. I bequeath my army to you. Rule the back rooms in my steed. As his essence burned to cinders, the forces of level 966 bowed their heads to 682, a backrooms legend to destroy all backrooms legend. Now go check out SCP-018, can the Super Bowl defeat SCP-682? And was SCP-682 really that hard to kill after all? For even more.